what's up people sorry um so uh we have facebook that won't go live on but we're live on youtube now from the lab and uh i'm just give me a second to get this zoom meeting set up and they'll let me in real soon tell tim to let me in the meeting so we can uh, So, yeah, we are here. Say hi, guys. We're live. All right. They should be um, loading up the Zoom meeting anytime now. Let me text Tim. Oh, it's already been uh, loaded up on the top of the page chat, right? Come on, Tim. Dang it, 20 minutes late for the party. We got stuck in traffic in New York, so I'm sorry about that, guys. And uh, we were meant to be here an hour ago and get set up. So, um, yeah, it's like a six hour drive. We left at like 10, but what is going on, guys? I can't. I'm waiting for them to go. I'm waiting to be let in. My hair is retarded right now. I should have got, got a haircut. Hello, hello, welcome, welcome, welcome. Now we're back on StreamYard, man. Hey guys, how's it going out there on the stream, man? I'm just gonna read uh, chats from the super chat right now while we're we're waiting for people to join up. Sorry, I'm at for the technical difficulties. So yeah, APEC is live now on the, the other channel, but um, we're about to get the stream going. Um, I'm just waiting to be led into the Zoom call by uh, Tim, the host. So um, can't make it today. Here we go. Too bad Trevor couldn't start it, right? Um, Jeremy can't make it today. Oh my God! No, I was I was on the way, uh, and I got stuck in traffic. There was a bunch of accidents on the highway. People were driving like absolute maniacs. I almost saw I almost saw two accidents, and then I I saw a th a third accident actually happen, and then we were just stuck in traffic and saw a bunch of accidents on the side of the road the whole way down here and um renee cruz hey what's up bernard greetings roger sarfati is on coast to coast tonight oh matt i couldn't agree more hey everyone live hola alex driving like maniacs in new york nope not in Zoom. We're still waiting. Yeah, there, there he is. There we are. Oh. 
Um, I'm not getting audio. Can I get up? Oh, Jesus. Is there audio coming through? I don't know what's going on with the audio. I'm not hearing any audio coming through. Why am I getting no audio, dude? What is going on? audio I saw I just heard it make a noise I just can't hear anything they're saying I don't hear any audio from this zoom call do you get it now do you hear them talking There's no options to this. No, they can't like that. Uh... It might just be like a technical. It might have to just um. Can you 
Can you guys hear me? Or I mean, you can hear me, but unmute in the left. I have to restart this computer. I'll have to restart the whole stream if I restart the computer. Let me restart Zoom. No? Why is it not getting any audio from Zoom? Can you hear anything? Nothing, not sound. It just completely fucking ignores me right now, dude. You guys hear me all right? That should be this microphone. Yeah. We'll do with that. Bro. Why can't I hear this?
Brother, you get that? Yeah, you, you still can't hear it?
Travis. He went to go get food and and um, drink. Oh, he's not there. Okay. Well, I probably should eat food before I drink a bunch of beer. Yeah. Uh, and we're broadcasting over to the shop speaker, so so we can uh, bring this Wi-Fi. There he is. Don't let that in. Uh, wow. Yeah, you can hear us. Hey, can someone... Yeah, here's what I'm gonna do, Bernie. Can you um, can you stream? Try sharing your screen. Join the Streamyard link. I want. Join that Streamyard link, and someone else try sharing their screen with their audio from this conference. Someone else who's in the conference. So I don't know what's going on with the why the. It's a company by
um, so if more zero, um, we Newtonian limit where only the one one component is non zero or uh, is um, deviating from one, and that's the Newtonian limit. Okay, it says you can't access, access your screen. Yes. Try capturing a different screen to see if this continues. Then the diagonal elements are one. Like in Minkowski space, only the one one component in the time has the Newtonian potential for gravity as symmetric components. Okay, you can hear it. Just stay here. So would it be safe to suggest that gravity, oh my God. gravitation, I power. is the
Can you guys hear the audio now? your speakers, but let, let me apologize for that. Um, let me see, does does anyone else have any questions that they wanted to ask Detlef? We're, we're ahead of schedule uh -huh. and that is fine. We actually have lots of stuff to present today, so. Yeah. Oh, this is your only oh uh, Michael, do you wanna go again? Go, go for it, sir. Um, so, this, she, uh, I'm, I'm just curious, this pion question, um, how do you know there's a, such a thing as a pion if you can't measure it, <laughs> is my observation. So it's kind of a theoretical construct, isn't it? Um, you just don't know. I, I, I don't know. No. Um, I, I wanted to present. No, oh, OK, they, I, I don't know what's. Uh, what is the field of pion? Yeah, okay. So, um, how, how, what's your feelings on uh, string theory uh, with 11 dimensions? Yes, um, for gravity and electromagnetism, uh, five dimensions are sufficient but we have also the weak force and the strong force and the strong uh, force with three charges and field particles with mass and it's yeah, the answer is probably you, yes. you need a lot of dimensions only for, for, for the forces between quarks and gluons. It's, it's beyond the Kadusa theory. Well, somebody Thank you, Michael. Is, uh, yeah. Okay, um, let me see. And I should ask if anyone else has questions. And again, we are, we are way ahead of schedule. Detlef, I, I appreciate your staying with us and answer all these questions. Um, let me see, does anyone else have anything? Uh, I have one, one statement. Oh, go, go for it, go for it, absolutely. Yes, I'm, I'm looking for, for a picture, just a moment. And I think since, since we're so far ahead of schedule, actually, um, I think Frank Milburn will probably come on and join us, and, and unless you had more to present, but I, I, I think so, I, I can uh, show it later. Oh, oh no, it's, it's completely up to you. It'll be a few minutes. Okay. I, I would say, go, go ahead, sir, go ahead. Okay. Um, do you think it is a picture? Um, normally we have um, a three axis X, Y, Z, which we can display in perspective on uh, screen. With, with four dimensions, we have a, a problem um, because we can only show two dimensions and time. And with, with five dimensions, it's even uh, more problematic. So I draw the four dimensions of space times in, in 
like across into four directions. And perpendicular is the fifth dimension, um, which has to be slanted. So there is a projection for for the four potential on on, on forty um, space. But if when we have no charge, um, phi, the fifth coordinate is perpendicular to the four axis of space time. And if you connect the, the, the ends of the, the arrows, you get a pyramid. So for me, a pyramid is a symbol for 5D theory. Yes, you, you have the, the axis, the, the space time for space time dimensions and the fifth dimension. And in, in this presentation uh, picture, they, they form a pyramid. And the pyramid could be a symbol for 5G theory. That's just uh, my opinion. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, so again, we're, we're, we are way ahead of schedule and, and there's no problem at all with that. But um, I think what, what I'd like to do is put it back on gallery view and everyone please give a giant hand once again for Detlef Hoyer. Dr. Hoyer, thank you so much for presenting. Okay, and yeah, and that's that is it's challenging material, and I think that was I, I think that was some of the difficulty with the Q and A part of it. So, okay, and then let me see that we should have Frank Milburn joining us in just a moment. Okay, well, so in the meantime, though, since we are ahead of schedule, um, what we could do, if you guys want, and I'm not sure if you guys are open to it. Um, I actually have a presentation. I was going to show it much later. I have one on UAP notes, though, from the new report. Yeah, oh, okay. Okay, well, let, let me do that then. Okay, there we go. Okay, perfect. And I'm not, there we go. I, that's how to get rid of that. Okay, um, so yeah, I guess that works. Again, my apologies. I, I watch everyone else do PowerPoint. I'm not that familiar with it myself. So this is the ODNI, ODNI Office of the Director of National Intelligence UMP report overview. Um, the, so the UAP report just came out yesterday. I have not had time to do like a completely thorough analysis of it, but, but I don't think anybody else really has either. Um, there have been a couple articles that have just come out about this. I'm expecting to see a bunch more. And in just a moment here, I believe Frank Milburn will be coming on to discuss this too. This is just a very brief slide show for some of the key points. So I wanted to start with report structure. Again, I'm in a bunch of mailing lists, email lists. And um, one of the complaints that I saw from many people about this is the entire report is only nine pages long. The actual body of the report, the part that matters is only five pages long, right? So this is a very short report, but you know, it is what it is. And, and uh, it contains summaries and conclusions, not detailed descriptions. So I, I, I think that that helps to offset the short length of the report. In other words, I was expecting to see something several hundred pages long. Um, after the 2008 economic crash, the Obama administration did an investigative report of that, that I believe was something like 300 plus pages. I thought with a subject as broad and comprehensive as UFOs, UAPs, we might see something that was perhaps similar in length. But 
Um, what helps offset that is they're providing summaries and conclusions, not the details. Maybe the details were in the classified annex, I'm not sure. Um, another thing that was in the mailing lists that I wanted to just kind of address was there are lots of qualifiers and softeners in this report. Um, so instead of saying yes or no, they would say it's likely to, it's not likely to, most sightings contained, many sightings contained. Um, again, they've softened the heck out of this and they've tried to qualify it as much as possible. And I think there are many reasons for that, you know? Um, part of it is just that the lack of hard knowledge on this, right? A lot of these reports, again, one of the things they mentioned over and over again was there wasn't a standard reporting process in place until just recently. Even that standard reporting process doesn't span the entire military. I believe it's uh, the, the Navy standardized first. And if I understand this correctly, the Air Force kind of picked up on that. So, you know, they've, they've tried to kind of keep it as vague as, as they can so that they're not incorrect about things, right? So uh, some of the videos, testimonies, and supporting data is already public. I, I thought that this was important to mention also. Obviously, they mentioned a lot of stuff in that report that we haven't seen. Maybe we'll never see it. But I think some of the key elements, right, the gimbal, go fast videos and things like that, they're already out there. We've already seen them. And so that, that helps. It's something to keep in mind, right? When you read this report, keep in mind that you've already seen some, maybe a lot of the data, you know. Uh, in terms of the scope of this report, it only includes military incidents between 2004 and 2021. Um, so this kind of creates a bifurcation in the UFO community. And this is something that was interesting to me. You know, this, this date goes back to, I mean, 1947, and actually UFOs go back further than that. But you could say the modern era started in 1947. And yet they're creating kind of this bifurcation of data where they're really only focused on these military incidents, starting with kind of the Nimitz encounter, right? So you've got 2004 to 2021. Interestingly, the majority of incidents were reported from the last two years due to better reporting. I thought that this was interesting that they put this in the report. Um, I had thought that they would focus mostly on the 2004 incidents, but it sounds like there are some very recent things that they were looking at as well. So there were 144 UAP reports originating from US government sources. 80 of those reports involved observations with multiple sensors. Okay. So I don't know, I, you know, I'd say that's close to a little bit over half of those. Uh, so UAPs are physical objects. Again, when I put these together, I tried to remove the qualifiers and the softeners. I looked, what are they really saying? They're really saying UAPs are physical objects. Not all of them, some of them, okay? Most of the UAPs reported probably do represent physical objects, given the majority were registered across multiple sensors, including radar, infrared, electro-optical weapon seekers, and visual observation. Obviously, not all of those all of the time, but over half were seen in multiple sources. So what the UAP task force is saying here is, hey, these things are real, right? Probably real, because again, everything is qualified and softened multiple types of UAPs. This to me is interesting because when I think UAP, because I've been focused on the military sightings, I'm thinking orbs and Tic Tacs. And, and those, those kind of have a, they, they seem like they kind of go together, I guess. Now, when they talk about UAPs, they're saying, okay, there are multiple types requiring different explanations. They categorize these into five categories. And I guess this makes sense. People handed them just this bag of stuff and they had to sort it out. So, so they listed those and I'm gonna skip reading this because I actually broke down the categories here. Five explanatory categories, airborne clutter, uh, balloons, birds, UAVs, airborne debris. The one I'm smiling when I think of this was the deflated Batman balloon that the jet went by at 600 miles an hour and somehow he managed to get a photo of it. I don't know if it was caught in the jet stream or what, but um, 
I saw that and I said, oh my God, that's a Batman balloon. And you know, I, so they, they, they did have one that they described definitively. They didn't say it was that one. They said they did have one that was a balloon. Um, that was one of the UAP sightings was a balloon. The rest, unknown. Uh, natural atmospheric phenomena, ice crystals, moisture. Uh, they also listed temperature inversions and a few other things. So uh, some of these things are known to throw radar off. I believe that modern radar systems are not as susceptible. And again, when you have multiple sensors, it, it's probably less likely to be susceptible than, you know, than older systems. But back in the back in the 1950s, the 1952, the UFOs over Washington, I believe that was explained as a temperature inversion, right? Which can fool radar. So, uh, so they, they listed that as a potential explanation. Another one, this interested me that they would mention it because again, this is an official US government report. They mentioned USG or industry developmental programs. What they're saying here is black projects might be classified US programs and they were unable to get confirmation that it was, right? Now, that's interesting on many, many different levels because um, it, it speaks to, I think it speaks to some issues within the US government if they're not able to tell whether or not it's theirs. But I think what they were really saying is it could be ours, but we didn't see anything to say that it was. So another one was foreign adversary systems. Um, this is one that's come up on the news many times. I believe Congress people like Marco Rubio and, and uh, I believe um, uh, several others have mentioned this as well. China, Russia, um, other nations or non-governmental entities or organizations, so the NGOs. So that, that was there. And then number five is other. This was a catch-all category. Um, which they said, and again, some of the language they used was interesting for an official government report, pending scientific advances to understand them. Now, I, to me, again, they never said aliens. They never said ET anywhere in this report. They never mentioned aliens or ET. But at the same time, pending scientific advances to understand them, I, I, I don't know. It seems like that kind of pushes into that territory. Not necessarily, but, but it kind of hints at it. So they also talked about a clustering of observations. Um, there was wide variability in the reports, not surprisingly. Uh, the data set was limited, not surprisingly. But what they found was they were, they, the UAP sightings tended to cluster and they had two different kinds of clusters. There was clustering of UAP observations regarding shape, size, and particularly propulsion. I thought that was very interesting. UAP sightings also tended to cluster around US training and testing grounds, but they assessed that this could, become, this could be from collection bias. In other words, um, these are military reports of UAPs. Where are you most likely to see them? Where there are the most military activity, most military people, right? And jets and things like that. It's gonna be training and testing grounds, stuff like that. Okay, um, so UAPs demonstrate advanced technology. Again, I thought that this was very interesting. They qualified the heck out of this. Um, you know, so it may demonstrate advanced technology, but there you have it. So they're talking about that. If, if this was gonna be explained away as swamp gas, like in the old days, they wouldn't have to talk about advanced tech at all. So they said in 18 incidents described in 21 reports, observers reported unusual UAP movement patterns or flight characteristics. Some UAP appeared to remain stationary in winds aloft, move against the wind, maneuver abruptly, or move at considerable speed without discernible means of propulsion. In a small number of cases, military aircraft systems process radio frequency energy associated with UAP sightings. That one is also very, very interesting. I, I was not aware of that. So that could mean jamming. It could mean that they were giving off, who knows, some kind of radio communications. It could mean a number of different things. They were able to detect RF energy associated with UAP sightings. 
So finally, we have demonstrating acceleration or a degree of signature management. Signature management could mean visual, could mean RF, it could mean jamming, there could be many different things. Um, so again, all of these are kind of techno signatures, right? Which I believe, I, I think that's the new word of the day. Now we're looking for alien techno signatures around the cosmos. Well, we also see techno signatures in UAPs, which to me indicates that these are artificial and intelligently controlled. Um, UAPs are a flight safety risk. UAPs clearly pose a flight, a safety of flight issue and may pose a challenge to national security. So I wanted to put that in there. They, their word was clearly, UAP clearly posed safety of flight issue. Safety concerns primarily center on aviators contending with an increasingly cluttered air domain. And there were 11 reports of documented instances in which pilots reported near misses with the UAP. Okay, so in other words, these things are getting up close and personal with or aviators as they're as they're flying as they're doing training exercise that's dangerous right this is something that we need to understand in more detail uh, there's also a potential national security risk and i think frank is on here he can speak to more of this in just a moment actually in about two seconds because this is my last slide uap sightings also tended to cluster around u.s training and testing grounds this could be a collection bias i already read that one too yeah i just wanted to kind of reaffirm that. Um, they said, again, it's the same statement, they put it in there twice. UAP have been detected near military facilities or by aircraft carrying the USG's most advanced sensor systems. And the UAPTF is monitoring for evidence of foreign adversary involvement, which basically just means they're keeping an eye on it. So that was, those were, those were kind of my takeaways from it. I'm gonna end the show now. Hope that was hope that was helpful. I'll stop sharing. And actually, let me go to let me go to Frank who just joined us. There you go. And hello. Hello, Frank. Thank you for joining us. I, I should apologize for ambushing you in the middle of uh, in the middle of the yeah, event. No problem. Have you got um have you got sound and vision? I, I have sound. I don't have your camera. Well, that is bizarre. Let me uh, let me just turn it off again and on. Okay. There we there, go. There we go. And thank I had the little for, capsule over it. <laughs> I, I, I want to thank you very much for joining us because you know as as you know as everyone knows the the, the six-month wait is over the report came out yesterday we have official word from the u.s military on what they think is going on and it's pretty vague and so you you have studied this in a greater level of depth than anyone else i know so thank you for for being able to speak about it yeah no worries no worries at all um I didn't have sort of um, too high expectations about it, and I was actually pretty impressed with, with what I saw. Um, hang on, let me just turn this light off here. That's, is that better? Yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't have massive expectations for it, but um, there's lots of good little nuggets in it. Um, but I saw a very good comment uh, from Psychoop on Twitter, and this is, I agree with it wholeheartedly, and he basically said, I'd urge everyone who felt underwhelmed by the report to go back and read the conclusions from the Robertson panel, yeah, uh, Project Blue Book and the Condon Committee. Now read the DNI report again. Um, basically, take the win um, because the, the the issue is moving forward. Um, it's UAP have been uh, basically put out there. They exist. They are craft seen on multiple sensors. This has now been you know officially declared in a report. Um, uh, you know, resources uh, are going to be put forward um, towards um, developing analysis of UAP. And uh, it's basically a very positive development as far as I'm concerned. I mean, if you were expecting hangar doors to open at Area 51 and all that kind of stuff, then, you know, you're going to be disappointed. I mean, if, if the U.S. Navy, and I've said this before, if the U.S. Navy has, you know, develops like a new hunter-killer submarine, would you really expect them to go into detail about the, you know, the, the acoustic coating 
that it has on its hull or the silent propulsion system. No, you wouldn't. Of course, the U.S. government isn't going to isn't going to tell all. Um, one thing that I saw was uh, w was missing from this. Um, they do go into the, the sort of the navigation uh, the navigation risk, uh, the air risk of collision. Um, they talk about you know the potential national security threat, but they didn't talk about um, the nuclear aspect. Now I know they've only gone back to 2004, but even if you include that uh, 2004, um, and also the incidents off the East Coast, like more recently uh, with the Roosevelt Carrier Strike Group, you've still got UAP in the vicinity of basically uh, nuclear powered and nuclear armed platforms because a strike group you know the carrier has you know obviously a reactor the submarines accompanying it will have a nuclear reactor they have you know they're nuclear armed so that's kind of concerning i mean i would have thought because that was already out there in the public domain that they could have stressed that i mean because that to me would be it would be a pretty significant factor what do you think tim yeah, I, well, and again, I mean, you did the, the so um, you, the paper, your first paper was called the Pentagon's UAP Task Force, and that yeah. was published at the, the Began Sadat Center. Um, and so people can Google that online, right? Anybody who's watching on YouTube now or anything like that, I would thoroughly recommend that they do that because you drilled down on this. You, you did a level of, of detail and analysis, and you cited numerous, numerous experts. In fact, your, I would say your report was probably 10 times better hundred times better than theirs, but, you know, um, so they did leave a lot of stuff out. I think they admitted that they were seen around military installations. They didn't, they didn't stress the nuclear part of it. I, that, that was, yeah. that, I, I think they could have stressed a lot more. I mean, the, you know, the actual, you know, the incursion threat, the fact that they are being seen, you know, uh, around training areas, um, you know, pilots reported seeing them, you know, for, for weeks, if not months on end. Um, they could have stressed that more. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, the nuclear aspect uh, and the other aspects of, you know, the threat will be in the classified report, and I would expect them to be. Um, and again, obviously, you wouldn't expect the government to go into that in detail. Um, but then the other question is, you know, what kind of uh, countermeasures are they thinking of developing for dealing with these UAP incursions? Um, because when you see fantastical technology, and this came out, I think, you know, in 1947 in the original Twining memo, um, you know, military and intelligence types, the first thing is like, wow, there's this technology, it's superior to ours. It's like, one, how do we counter it? And two, how do we acquire it? Well, you know, one of the things that's interesting to me is, again, this bifurcation, right? Because, I, I, and I've heard this, I think John Alexander has said this in email. He said, well, they haven't destroyed us so far, therefore they're not a threat, right? And so then there's this question of, okay, um, how long have they been here? You know, is this 2004 to 2015, or does this go back to 1947? Or, I, I mean, I, somebody sent me photos of Renaissance paintings with what looked like UFOs drawn on them, you know, that go yeah. back to the 1500s. So, so this bifurcation that they've kind of created by saying, okay, 2004 is where it begins, everything forward from there is what we're going to study. That's useful, but it leaves a lot of larger questions unanswered. And I know that they can't answer those definitively, but it would be nice to know, you know, did this start then or does this go back further? Well, I mean, arguably, I mean, arguably, if you could talk about, uh, you know, what they basically haven't mentioned, which is the actual when they've actually tried to intercept them with weapons, right? So if you go back to, you know, the 1976 Tehran case, and the 1980 Peru case were both cases where military aircraft um, attempted to intercept UFOs and actually attempted to fire weapons. In the Peru case, um, the pilot you know, emptied like 600 rounds of 23 Mike Mike into a UFO. And he actually says, and in, he's interviewed in Leslie Keen's book, he said, you know, I had air to air combat with UFO, right? <laughs> but his rounds didn't do anything. And then the Tehran case, you had the pilot thought, you know, that there was a projectile actually launched at him because there was, you know, an orb that kind of flew past him. He thought it was something that had been launched at his aircraft. And then he tried to select a missile and, and his weapon systems went offline. And you know, both those, you could argue, are mass sightings. The Peru case, I think they were like, you know, there was like 1,500 guys on parade, like at this uh, uh, this air base in Peru, and they, everybody saw this craft. And then the Tehran case, it was seen, you know, multiple uh, radar operators. It was seen by, um, you know, four crew members of two separate um, 
Imperial Iranian Air Force Phantoms. So you could you could arguably say that that was a mass sighting event as well because civilians saw it. You know, the lights in the sky too. So. I would be very interested in those cases where American aircraft or NATO aircraft attempted to intercept uh, UAP and attempted to launch weapons at them, because um, that would give you a much better idea of the threat, both in terms of um, what was going through the minds of, uh, you know, the, the military when they attempted to, well, effectively, you know, shoot down the UFOs. And the, the other side is, you know, what effect did the weapons have on the UFOs, if any? Yeah. Well, Frank, let, let me do this. Let me share my screen really quick. And let me see if let me see if that works. I've never shared a window before. I've always done share screen. So this came out yesterday. I wanted to show you this, but I thought I thought I should probably show the whole audience this. Hopefully you guys can see it. Okay. Uh, why the Pentagon UFO report is deeply troubling for US security experts. Now, they had already I bet you they'd already written most of this because this came out the same day as the report. And actually it came out at 1704 Eastern time. So they probably only had a couple of hours to write it. So either they had the fastest author or they already had most of it in place. Um, the thing that got me about it was this about halfway down in this Guardian article. So and I'll just read it. It's Marik von Renenkampf, who served at the Pentagon as an analyst in the State Department's Bureau of International Security and Non-Proliferation said that if a foreign power was behind the aircraft, uh, they would have performed a breathtaking technological leap and US intelligence would have suffered an immense failure. Now, I'm not sure if he keeps getting requoted or not. I don't think so. I think that he is saying the same thing verbatim. Maybe that's the party line that other people have said. Um, then he said, China has well-documented issues with basic jet engines. They rely on espionage to develop their most advanced systems. So I struggle with China having developed this. Russia has a defense budget that is a fraction of the United States and much of its military infrastructure is crumbling. So I struggle with that too. Uh, and he, he went on to say, if it's China or Russia, then it's extraordinary. I don't know how they did it. It would be monumental failure of intelligence collection on the part of the United States. So Frank, the reason I wanted to, sorry, I didn't mean to scroll up. The reason I wanted to show that to yourself and our audience was, um, do you think these statements kind of rule out any kind of Earth-based powers? Or, or, Yeah, I do. Um, I do. I mean, obviously, keeping an open mind. But I mean, we discussed, uh, remember, Tim, you, know, you and I um, and you know, the, the other members uh, of APEC who were there and also um, uh, with Nick, Nick Pope, we discussed, we went into this in some detail. Is it Chinese tech? Is it Russian tech? And uh, what this guy says about um, China has well documented issues with basic jet engines. You remember I said that the Chinese, had be, the Russians had refused to sell them uh, the most up to date engines that they had for their fifth generation jet. So their Chengdu fighter, which is basically looks like a copy of American stealth, uh, a fifth gen aircraft, is using a 1980s, a 1980s jet. Yeah because the Russians don't want to sell the Chinese, um, you know, this engine. So the, 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 we discussed how the Chinese are basically trying to buy, acquire this, uh, this aero engine maker in Ukraine, which could provide them with a much better jet for their fifth generation fighter, because arguably their fifth gen fighter isn't a fifth gen fighter if it's got a 1980s jet in it and it has, it's had, you know, um, you know, marked performance issues, right? They've seen it at air shows, for example. Um, if you look as well at like, you know, Chinese intentions, I mean, if you look at the, their current capabilities, what they have, I mean, there's nothing that indicates um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, five observable uh, tic-tac tech, as Jack Sarfati would call it. Um, their intentions in public, um, you know, their leadership has stated in public that they want to retake Taiwan by force if necessary, that it's the inevitable consequence of uh, you know, the reunification of the country. So there's no doubt about it. And if you look at what, you know, how they've been developing their military over the last 20 years, amphibious forces, airborne forces, rocket forces, air forces, uh, naval forces, it's all geared towards one, uh, invading Taiwan and two, uh, ensuring anti-access area denial to make sure that, you know, the Americans, the Japanese and the Australians can't interfere once the Chinese feel that they've got to a, a stage where they can overwhelm Taiwan's defenses. Yeah, because it's not just about attacking the island. They have to stop America intervening. Um, 
So if they had UAP technology, i.e. five observable tech, they'd already be in Taiwan, right? If the Russians had five observable tech, why would they just be in Crimea? They would have the whole of Ukraine, they'd have the Baltic states, they would have reconstituted the former Soviet Union, because clearly uh, Putin and you know Russian population in general are unhappy about what happened with the former Soviet Union, hence their war in Georgia in 2008. Um, and again, if you look at the, like, the development of the Russian forces, what have they been doing? They haven't been able to modernize across the board, so uh, they've had to sort of cherry pick um, you know, because they've got even you know far more limited resources than the Americans have available, and then the Chinese have available. So they've modernized subs, they've modernized some nukes. They basically spend a lot of money on electronic warfare. Um, they basically fitted everything that floats with cruise missiles and anything that flies with cruise missiles. Um, but uh, and also expeditionary forces like airborne and marines, and you've seen this in. Um, uh, in Syria, you know, that they fielded like, you know, their latest kit, but the Russians have had to, you know, really, really choose just a few areas, you know, to like modernize or even, you know, just, uh, you know, stay up to date with because they can't afford to modernize across the board. And, you know, I've seen no evidence that they have anything, uh, you know, remotely approaching, um, you know, five observable tech. And, yeah. you know, if you look at it, sorry, if you marry that up with their intentions, um, you know, the, the Russians wouldn't be worried, for example, you know, recently that Royal Navy vessel in, in the Black Sea. Well, you know, there wouldn't be any NATO vessels in the Black Sea if the Russians had uh, UAP technology. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, I, you know, I was going to ask about this five observables, too. One of the things, Gary Stevenson had mentioned this in an earlier conference, that um, the UAP met the pilots back at the cap point, right? And, and in order to do that, they would have had to understand... Uh, our communication signals. Do you think that might be a sixth observable? That, that I mean, the ability to, and, and I guess there's no guarantee that that's what happened, but it seems like they were able to monitor, decrypt, and understand our communications. Yeah, I actually talked about that in some detail with um, with uh, Dr. Jack Sarfati uh, in my first paper. And uh, I was just actually trying to, uh, going to pull it up, but off the top of my head, there, there was a number of different options. It was like um, one, uh, the the UAP to get you know to understand and to, uh, what was happening to be at the cap point um, would have to have some kind of like you know very uh, advanced quantum uh, you know uh, post quantum computing uh, and predictive technology. Uh, two, it would be it was hard hardwired into uh, navy uh, communications and. Uh, and um, and journey management systems, navigation systems. Uh, three, uh, there was a human agent on board the U.S. Navy vessels, like transmitting to the UAP what was going on. Uh, four, uh, the UAP was hardwired or could somehow access the navigation systems of the aircraft. Five, this is talking with, with Dr. Jack. It was you know um, uh, basically time travelers from the future. If you want to go, um, the, you know, the Michael Masters route. So the UAP, the intelligence that's behind it, already knew what was going to happen and where the cap point was going to be. You know, so there's <laughs> there's a lot of different possibilities here. But the fact is that it's highly advanced, and um, maybe you could add to that as yes, as a sixth observable, um, a a completely autonomous, uh, you know, conscious um, AI, as Dr. Jack Sarfati would say. Absolutely, absolutely. That's and that that's been something that's kind of interesting, you know. If, if, if like, if, yeah, if, sorry. If there aren't living personnel inside the craft, I mean, the Tic Tac's quite small, so the alien, you know, if they're aliens or transdimensionals or whatever, if, if it's like living beings, they'd, they'd have to be pretty small. Yeah. No, I, I I was just wondering about you know like the more observables you can add, the better. That's kind of my thought, right? That it's it's the more stuff you can kind of pin down and you know. Um, well, do you think it's okay if we open it up and take some questions? Yeah, can I just, sorry, can I just make one, one more point? Sure, sure. I was actually looking for this. It was actually not in the report at all, but there's another little gem that nobody picked up on, which was the actual press release by, um, by Admiral John Kirby uh, from, the M, uh, from the MOD, from the DOD. And if you go right down to the end... Oh, do you want to do a, do, do a screen share on it? Or um, I could do... Let me just see. Um, let me just share my screen. And let me just see where it is. Um, 
Okay, have you got that? Yeah, yeah. There we go. A statement by Pentagon Press Secretary, you got that? Ah, perfect. Okay. Uh, if you go down to the end, so it says this plan will be developed in coordination with various DOD components, right? Then you go down a bit and it says the plan will establish procedures for synchronizing collection, reporting, and analysis of UAP, provide recommendations for securing military test and training ranges, and identify requirements for the establishment and operation of new follow-on DOD activity to lead the effort. So he's talking recommendations for securing military test and training ranges, yeah? So, uh, you know, you're not talking about like fencing and floodlights here. How are you going to stop uh, UAP coming in? If you go on what we know, like the Tehran case, the Peru case, um, kinetic energy weapons don't work, rockets don't work, um, you know, missiles, whether it's radar homing or infrared. Uh, so how are you going to stop these, EM, uh, th these um, UAP? Are we talking some kind of... Uh, uh, directed energy weapon? Are we talking uh, an electromagnetic pulse that they're developing to use against the, U the, the UAP? Maybe to, and I'm just speculating here, kind of like, a, you know, destabilize the warp field uh, potentially, and then maybe use like rail guns to, to penetrate once the, once the, 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 the warp field is down. Uh, I'm just speculating here. But I thought that was a very interesting little nugget. Recommendations for security, securing military test and training ranges. You know, how are you going to do that? What does it involve? Yeah, no, that, that is interesting. So it, it's interesting to see that that buried in kind of the, yeah, the, 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 I don't know, the launch of the report. Well, so let me see. Uh, let me see who has questions. Uh, who, who has questions for Frank or, or myself, but I've probably exhausted everything I know. And we've got about 15 minutes left here. Uh, I'll make a quick point. Sure, sure. Go yeah, for if it. we're talking about um, you know whether it's like U.S. tech, well, one, you know, when I talked, remember when we did the Catalina sightings uh, presentation, I talked about, you know, I talked to Kevin Day for that, right? So he's, you know, he's an expert, right, on uh, on air defense, on, and, and especially on um, you know naval air defense operations. So he was saying you would never ever like have you know this kind of like advanced tech if it was American kind of like grafted onto the top of like an exercise, especially when you're gearing up and preparing and preparing to go to war, because that would just, that would just inject a whole level of, of, uh, of risk, right? On, on top of what's already going on with aircraft in the air. And he actually said the reason why the aircraft uh, were basically directed to intercept the object that on the radar that turned out to be Tic Tac was precisely because he went to uh, his officer and he said, look, you know, there's potentially a, an air navigation risk and we need to check it out because of these, these things are flying around in the airspace. Yeah. yeah. So that, that, that introduces the whole element of, of the, of the air navigation risk. Um, also as well, why would you use, um, you know, your most advanced, uh, if you, if, if it were American technology, why would you do that when you have ranges like in, in, in Nevada, you've got ranges all over the States where you can, you basically have these radars and you can set up all the sensor systems, all the, uh, you know, surface to air missile systems that you want to basically test, uh, you know, the, these craft against you just, I, I just don't see how you would do that. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Well, let, let me go to Alex. He had his hand up first. Alex, go for it, sir. Uh, hey guys. So great discussion. I, I really, uh, learned a lot and, uh, I agree with like, you know, 95% of what you guys are saying and think that uh, a lot of these things are probably uh, extra planetary in origin. But I just wanted to touch on the thing in the report about the industrial development programs and what you guys think about the possibility that, you know, some percentage of these things are from unacknowledged wave special access programs, you know, since they don't have to notify uh, Congress, you know, when they're uh, developing those. Well, I go back to my the, the the point that I just made. First of all, it would be incredibly dangerous and reckless to put that into the middle of uh, you know like a major workup exercise. If you're talking about say 2004, or you're talking about the Roosevelt Group, um, you know both times there were carrier groups which were pre preparing to go on deployment out to the Middle East. So that would be incredibly reckless to do that. No, I don't um, mean those. I just mean okay. the, like the fact that like some of these orbs flying around or something like that, not, not the ones intervening in, in conflict or in training, just okay. that some of these craft that are being sighted might be, you know, 
manufactured by Battelle or something like Jeremy has done some research into? Well, sure. I mean, if you if you look back, I mean, lots of you know there are aircraft, you know, which are, you know sort of triangular looking. Um, you know, when the Blackbirds started flying, when the stealth aircraft and the stealth fighter, you know, first flew, that was like 1977. So you know, there were there would have been sightings. People would have thought that was maybe like a UFO because they looked so kind of outlandish for the time. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's perfectly feasible. I mean, people. Um, it's it, you know the, the trained military observer will, will, will know the different aircraft types, but even a trained military observer, if you saw something that you know wasn't uh, effectively in your logbook, something that was like so secret that hadn't you know actually been deployed yet, then you know you might mistake it for something else as well. But I think um, you know a trained military observer, if a civilian observer is different, a trained military observer you know will tell okay, it's basically it's like a jet aircraft, it has a certain means of propulsion, you know. You know, and I, I could speak to that too, Alex. Um, I, I guess I have kind of two thoughts on the Black Projects thing. And, and the reason that I put it in my slide deck was I thought it was interesting that they mentioned that. Um, now, they it, it makes sense that they would mention it if they didn't know, right? So so it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean that it is or is not. It just means that they didn't know. But it, it, did, it did interest me, I guess, on two accounts. One of them is I don't personally think that it's a black project. I don't personally believe in secret space force. And, and the reason is you have to have a manufacturing industrial base to create any of these things. Now, I've, I've worked a long time in the IT industry. In the IT industry, they say to produce the first Intel chip, it costs several billion dollars. And the next chip after that costs a few pennies, right? And the idea is you have to have tons and tons of you know, trained people and specialized equipment and tooling and sub components, right? It's not just one company that makes these, it's a thousand different companies making parts that come together into each one of these things. And so to try and hide all of that for technology that's as advanced as these UAP seem to be, that, that doesn't seem feasible to me. You, you would have had leaks going back years from people saying, hey, I'm making parts for a UFO. So that's that's number one. That now number two is it. It's a little bit it, again. The only way I can interpret that report mentioning black projects is if they genuinely didn't know and just said, "Let's put this out there as a possibility." But for okay, for a part of the government or a contractor under contract for the government to design something like that. And not only not tell the military about it, right? So that you know you're you're disrupting training exercises, you're over military bases, you're doing all sorts of things that are kind of dangerous and unplanned, unscheduled, and then you're not going to tell anybody about it. And then when the government does an inquiry on it, you don't tell the force that's doing the inquiry, right? So to me, that I would say to me that says that there's no way that these are black projects. These are I believe there's some kind of an E.T. von Neumann probe, but if it was a black project, I would say that the failure in intelligence is not just intelligence, but the failure in intelligence, coordination, and everything else. It, it doesn't mean, let's say it has some top secret ultra whatever clearance, right? It doesn't mean that they have to tell the UAP task force details about it. All they have to just say is, hey guys, you know what? Just that's ours. Leave this alone. You know, nobody said that they didn't get any information back. But what, what that says to me is that's because there's nobody to say that. So I, I don't think it's ours. Yeah, could I just answer that one as well? I mean, I totally agree with everything that Tim said. I mean, even you know, so few countries in the world that can build, say, like a fourth generation jet, let alone a fifth generation jet. Right. That's why the Europeans usually get together like two or three com uh, uh, countries. And, and, you know, dozens and dozens, and it's not just dozens and dozens of companies, it's like, you know, hundreds of companies, potentially the ones that produce screws, windshields, you know, ejector seats, whatever. And to keep all that secret, as Tim said, would be incredibly difficult. Now, my own personal view, if these, if these craft, right, with five observable tech, if they were American military tech, then there wouldn't be a UAP incursion problem, right? <laughs> because the Americans would be able to intercept them. Um, if they were in the military and uh, the sort of you know private uh, you know aerospace company, then you'd have to ask yourself, well, if they were capable of building these craft, why wouldn't they have sold them to the American military? Because it would be like the sale of the century. You could you could basically sell to the American government, and you could name your price. You could say, right, the Americans will have uh, you know uh, undiminished and uh, and continual you know uh, 
complete total spectrum dominance for basically the rest of time. Nobody, no other, no other power in the world will be able to touch you. Yeah. So, you know, th 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 those are issues as well. Th there's no way that it, if uh, private companies are capable of this, uh, capable of, of deploying this tech, that they wouldn't be selling it. They would make billions and billions and billions. You know, companies are uh, companies are in business to basically make profit, right? Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm going to have to disagree with you guys. I think probably like one to 3% of these things were made on earth, but I agree that like the vast majority of them are not, but um, thank you. Those are all really good points and you guys have done a great presentation. I learned a lot. So thank you so much. Oh, well, thanks Alex. And it's completely okay to disagree. It's totally okay. It's just I, in my case, it's just <laughs> yeah. kind of my gut feeling, but uh, let, let me go to, yeah. let me go to Mark next. Uh, Mark. Or, or Mark's PC, because I see there's Hi. him. And... Yeah. Hey, it's Aiden here. Uh, I don't know hey, if you Aiden. can hear me. Yeah. Um, I, was, I wanted to re respond to Frank, but the, uh, the AFRL Directed Energies Directorate in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, they, they mastered high-powered lasers somewhere in the late 90s. Uh, I graduated from UNM in 2014, and I uh, was trying to get on on base or that's where the good money is in new mexico uh and they were in the classes that i was attending they were talking about high powered microwave systems being ju just about ready for deployment in 2014. um I, we're we're way further ahead but you just got to research the sandia Al laboratories technology ecosystem or its engineering ecosystem and i mean i've had a, a discussion with uh, an engineer there and i was trying to pursue um thin film coatings and uh, and then he talked about a, a weapons test that he was involved with and they were given a, a time and a vector and they were i don't know what the weapon system was but they were shooting at something and it had they, their weapon system had radar and they he said he couldn't hit it. It just went right over them, totally silent, uh, using field effect propulsion. Uh, the, uh, the so there's we're we're further ahead than the and it, it's we're playing a game of poker from the U.S. perspective. Um, you know, I can tell you from like about like operational security. Like China has infiltrated. You know, they're using academia in order to get out information. Um, so I'm sure they're, they're rapidly developing or catching up with anything that the United States has developed. Uh, Raytheon, that's the one that, look into the high powered microwave systems that Raytheon's been working on. You know, the, the CHAMP uh, cruise missile, it was a cruise missile that they can fire through a, a city and it has a, uh, probably like a phased array system with a you know a targetable high pulse, uh, you know high high field strength microwave pulse that can fly it through a city and knock pop 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 and take the city off the grid by uh, firing at specific sensitive technologies. So um, we're we're playing a game of poker, and the the report has been tailored for your average politician um i say that from working at the aspen institute in my my 20s which is a, a policy center it's not a think tank it's you know i've met henry kissinger before knowing who henry kissinger was <laughs> um but i've had you know at the aspen institute they have these policy meeting groups and people go there and they talk or they're given a briefing um they may be like one or two star generals ranking their way up so yeah I mean the, that report was watered down tailored for your average congressman senator that has like eight or ten other special interests that they're working on but this is like you know an issue of the national security uh, and so the it's it's vague but pointed enough for like the staffers and the congress or the, these politicians to have a uh, meaningful discussions now so that's that's all i uh, wanted to contribute 
No, thanks, Aiden. Well, and I, I, your thoughts on the report were interesting too. And, and, and it is worth noting that in the, in the last page or so, they did say, you know, if you want a better report, it costs more money. <laughs> well, go figure. <laughs> you ask Congress. Wait, they're charging for it? Oh my God. <laughs> uh, yeah, you have to ask the Senate Appropriations Committee and then they have they send it over to the the next senate committee it's a two two part two two office uh dance that you do um yeah the well it's it's like it's like you know they, they've got like the what is it the, the the bronze uh silver and gold tier report right and so apparently the american public <laughs> we we only paid for bronze and we should have done gold you know but i think that's how it works I just want to say, yeah, I thought those um, I thought those are excellent points that you made, um, both about the report, also about the uh, the Chinese, um, basically espionage. Espion, espion, oh, absolutely, uh, that was something actually that when I was at KPMG back in um, 1998, I did a project on uh, on like knowledge management, and I and I did a, uh -huh. a study on it, and uh, e even right back then, I mean, this has been decades in the ma making. They're they're kind of like steady infiltration and hoovering up of everything, which is why I said like you know like their Chengdu fifth gen fighter. Okay, they want to get like a Russian jet for it, but it looks like you know an F thirty five, right? Um, right? And uh -huh. you know, and why and why they've knocked everything off from the Russians? Whatever they can't copy, they steal. Um, and I was going to say another issue is. For sure, the Chinese will have everything that the Russians have on on UAP technology and everything that the Russians know. The Chinese will have bought it or you know um, um, stolen it somehow, just as yeah. you know anybody else would want to do. I mean, China but, and Russia are really they're you know they just went into that uh, lunar space station strategic agreement or whatever the acronym is. But um, also since like 2017, Russia and China have been. We're, we're not on propulsion, but they're, they're trying to create a, a gold back petrol yuan, yeah, uh, ruble yuan, right? They're unifying their use of oil and their, their, their monetary system and actually backing it by gold, whereas, you know, this fourth estate's in control of uh, our money making machine, and we have, uh, you know, the US war backed petrol dollar i mean i'm so, i uh, no it's okay you know. well, well aiden i i and i hate to interrupt I, I hate to cut you off but um actually we're so we're pushing up on two o'clock and so matthew sadagas is going to do a presentation but before that so i what i want to do first is mute everybody out and i'm going to put it on gallery view and again everyone please say thank you to frank milburn for his time and expertise Frank, thank you for joining us. I know this was completely impromptu. He, he had just pinged me earlier and he said, I can talk if you, if you need it. I, I said, wait a minute, we have a window of open time. Yeah, let's do it. So, um, okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Tim, and cheers. And thanks I'm again, Frank. Balls. Thanks, guys, for the questions as well. Cheers. Okay, so uh, let's go to Matthew Sadagas. Before we go there, I want to I wanna introduce this gentleman for us. Um, so Dr. Matthew Stoggis is an assistant professor of physics at the University of Albany and recently presented what is the possible connection between UAPs and dark matter at the SCU conference on May 27th. Today, he'll be presenting on dark matter and dark energy. What are they and can either be used as propellant? So Matthew, I, I just checked. I know you were in the audience. I am indeed here. Ah, wonderful, sir. And could I get you to turn your camera on? Yes. Here I Wonderful. am. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. Take it away. And again, All right. thank, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. Let me uh, share my screen here and uh, get started. All right. So today um, I'm going to be telling you about uh, work that I've been doing on with a, a, a great deal of collaborators on dark matter, a little bit of dark energy as well as Tim said, and some really speculative ideas I had on w how an advanced a civilization might be able to make use of one or or both of these as a means of either uh, propulsion, uh, propellant in some cases, both a propellant and a fuel perhaps. So the story uh, begins with an astronomer in the 1930s named Fritz Wicke. He was a Swiss astronomer there um, on the left who 
cluster found that there wasn't sufficient mass within the visible mass of the stars of those galaxies in order to explain why that cluster was stable and not uh, flying apart. And so he coined, he's, he's famous for coining the term uh, dark matter, but it took a lot of decades where this was not, uh, this was not taken seriously uh, for a great many decades until uh, over 40 years later, where we have the work of uh, Dr. Vera Rubin on the right. And she found better and much better and, and more comprehensive and deeper evidence that something was going on by not looking at individual galaxies, but stars, individual stars within galaxies and their velocities and kinetic energies. And it's very unfortunate, Dr. Rubin only passed away a few years ago. It's very unfortunate that she, um, so a lot of uh, colleagues in my field think she should have gotten uh, the Nobel Prize, which can't be awarded pos posthumously um, because Nobel Prize was given for dark energy with a lot less evidence and not to her for her work on galactic rotation curves. She passed away a few years ago in her 80s. Um, what was, so Rubin's work was really important. It was looking at the revolution, the speeds of revolution of stars around centers of galaxies. So the expect, expectation is, is that as you move away from a center of mass, such as in our own solar system here on the left, this is taken from the essay, Weighing the Universe by Rubin actually um, in the early 90s. And we know that you know Venus orbits the sun uh, more slowly than Mercury, Earth more slowly than Venus, Mars more slowly than the Earth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is a very well-known mathematical law. You set the um, Newton's law of gravity, GMM over R squared, equal to uh, centripetal force mv squared over r and velocity should go drop off as one over the square root of the radius but that and that's what observed that's what's observed in our solar system um we've discovered thousands of exoplanets is observed in other solar systems but this does not appear to work on large scales um it does not appear to work on galactic scales so when we look at uh m33 uh, for example or even our own galaxy we see that instead of a, the expected drop off as radius goes to infinity from the center of a galaxy, instead we see an increase or an asymptote even, or both in some cases. And we can extend beyond where we see stars and actually by using the uh, 21 centimeter line from hydrogen, you can extend these curves even further into the darkness here where there are very few stars or star clusters, but there is uh, gas and dust with hydrogen. And you see that the trend continues of everything that's in orbit around the centers of a galaxy. And the Another, here's yet another example, galaxy NGC 3198, and there's the data, and, and there's the fit that has two components, a halo of regular matter, baryonic, leptonic matter, and then a disk of, no, sorry, I went backwards, halo is the dark matter, disk, the flat disk, is the ordinary matter, and then you have a spherical or absoidal halo of dark matter, you add these two components together. Now, there's a great, there, there are many problems with this approach, though, because there are a lot of free parameters you need a different amount of dark matter for every galaxy. So slide three alone, this is not sufficient evidence that says there's this new matter. This could imply instead that we need to modify our theory of gravity to explain this. So this by slide by itself is, um, is not sufficient. And so there's a lot more that we can look at though. So on slide four here, we can look at X-rays from gases that are between galaxies. So these splotches you see here, these are not stars. These are galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars, each are trillions of stars. So in the center of the image is NGC 0507, a galaxy. And in the visible image, you see all these different, um, all these other splotches are ga other galaxies or dwarf galaxies that are orbiting it. And on the left in blue, this is from the Chandra X-ray Observatory. In blue, in the false color image, you see uh, where you have hot X-ray emitting gases. And they, they're not supposed to be there because there isn't sufficient gravity just from what we observe from the visible, from the light, from the visible matter um, in the stars in those galaxies. So the question is, what is binding those gases in place together to make those X-rays considerably outside the visible elliptical galaxy and satellite galaxies in the visible image? So in, um, I, I was watching uh, one of those uh, 
you know, Netflix documentaries, not meant for scientists, engineers, though, but for the general public about uh, physics, you know, just for fun. And Michio Kaku was on there and referred to how, like dark matters, like the force in Star Wars surrounds us and binds us, binds the galaxy together. And the, the, so these data from slides three and four can be explained by a postulating a spherical halo of dark matter around something like a flat disk-like galaxy, either spiral or a spherical galaxy like in um, ellipse. So that's still not the end of the story, though, because you could still modify gravity to still explain this. This isn't completely different from the last slide. So why are we still so sure there's something to look at? And that's gravitational lensing. So in my experience, um, in my work in this field, I haven't found um, a single uh, theory of modified gravity that can mathematically, consistently and reliably reproduce gravitational lensing um, they all, they're all able to do the rotation curve. So why am I, I convinced that there is something extra, that there's extra mass out there and we don't just need to retool uh, general relativity, for example. And that's because, so the, the vast majority of, of theories or models of modified gravity that, that I've seen, they can explain the rotation curves extraordinarily well. One could argue even using Occam's razor even better then the dark matter approach. They might even do this, but they can't explain uh, gravitational lensing. So gravitational lensing, this is the effect where gravity bends light, just like your eyeglasses or contact lenses, but large masses um, produce a substantial bending of light. Or, I mean, it's equivalent mathematically. You can think of it as, of course, the space-time is bending and the light is still going in straight lines in a curved space-time. That's just, but that's philosophical. The math is identical, whether you call it light bending or whether you call it the light is always going straight, but in a warped space-time. And what we find is that, let's say we're observing a distant galaxy, but there's an intervening cluster of galaxies. So each of these galaxies here have supermassive black holes at their centers, have hundreds of billions or even trillions of stars. So there's a lot of mass in that galaxy cluster. And what it does is it distorts the light. And so instead of the galaxy looking like this, you see a lensed galaxy, kind of like imagine looking at something um, inside uh, or through a glass or uh, you know wine glass or champagne glass and looking at um, you know, a, a, a painting through the through that glass, and you don't just get distortion or warping, but you do get duplication. Also, you see the same galaxy like multiple times, like in the lower left. Um, so the next thing, though, is that we put this gravitational lensing together with other imagery, uh, so with visible light and with the X-ray. So here on the right, this is the uh, famous or infamous bullet cluster image where we have um, we've got. We've got plus two clusters of galaxies actually over a billion light years away that are colliding, merging. And what's happening is, is that the visible light, a map of mass from the visible light doesn't match the gravitational lensing map. And it doesn't match the, um, it doesn't match the uh, X-ray emitting gases in pink. And so the center of the pink blobs doesn't match the center of the blue, bo blue blobs from gravitational lensing, and it doesn't match the center of mass calculated from the galaxy. So again, these splotches of light here are not stars. Well, there's some intervening nearby stars like this in the image, but these are galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars. So these are the, those are the scales you're looking at. Now, even this is not quite enough because now what it can be argued that the image on the right, it does not demonstrate we have dark matter versus modified gravity, what it does show is that if dark matter exists, that it's not baryonic. So there's still an argument that can be made even with this, um, with this evidence that we still, um, we still don't, don't have the final, um, it is not, it is considered very conclusive, but there's still a way, way of wiggling out here. Um, and, and so, but what's really interesting about this image is if you do interpret it as dark matter, it's, it's quite, it's relatively easy to understand what's going on here where you have a collision between two galaxies, galaxy clusters rather, um, hot gas mixing in the center. And then we have these lobes and these lobes are dark matter, like passing through the central collision and creating these lobes on the side. Um, uh, Tim, I actually have a question for you before I go to my next slide, because since I haven't been here before, I don't know what the, um, um, what the culture is of the conference. I see that messages are pop are starting to pile up in the chat. Do you do questions and answers during, after, 
or both? Like, what is your preference, Tim? You know, uh, we typically do them after, and that way okay. it doesn't interrupt your flow. Gotcha. Right? Okay. I, I, there, I, since I saw them piling up, I just wanted to make sure and to let people know I'm not ignoring you. Because and we'll, I guess then we'll, yeah, we'll answer questions at the end. So, so because I see like a little red number and the, they're piling up. So, so you're collecting them, Tim, and you'll you'll read them out loud at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Let me continue then. Thank you. I just want to make sure because every conference I go to has a different, different rules. So let me continue. So then we're looking here, we're looking here at the, the bullet cluster there, but this is the classic example. There's a whole bunch of other images like that. Um, but that's still not the end of the story because then we've got something called the cosmic microwave background radiation, also known as the echo of the Big Bang or last surface of scattering. And this is caused by the universe cooling down to the point where it becomes tra uh, become transparent uh, to photons that no longer have enough energy to break apart atoms they're starting to form. And so the CMB, which is this pixelated map on the right, this is an image of the hot and cold spots in the universe. And it, they're very small fluctuations, much, 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 much less than 1%, those orange and blue pixels. But if we do a Fourier analysis and do a power spectrum, we see these humps and we can fit these humps to models of how different forms of dark matter and, and regular matter and different forms of matter and energy, how do they behave? And so what we get out of that is something called the, um, this pie chart, which is known as the standard cosmological model. And in this pie chart, you see 25% dark matter, 69% dark energy, 5% atomic matter. And where do we get that? We get that by the different effects that these each of these components have. So dark matter interacts primarily gravitationally, but atomic matter is interacting both gravitationally, but it also has the electromagnetic strong and weak nuclear forces. And so that's the differentiation between dark matter and atomic matter. Now the 69%, which I'll mention in the six, second half of my talk, but I could easily say something um, wrong because actually I, the dark energy, that is not my field of research, but it's kind of the elephant in the room. It's 69%. So I figured there's, it can't, can't avoid touching upon that, at least partially. So, so even though my focus and my own, you know, my day-to-day -day research is dark matter, we will talk a little bit about dark energy, which we know even less about, except that we know the, the universe is accelerating its expansion. Then we've got dark matter that's producing gravity that slows the expansion of the universe down. Now, this 5% atomic matter, you might think, does that mean we only understand 5% of the universe? But actually, it's much much worse than that, because of that 5%, the vast majority is hydrogen. It's about three quarters of this 5% is hydrogen and one quarter helium. So literally everything in you and me, carbon, oxygen, phosphorus, silicon, these elements that are crucial for life, biochemistry, we are the sub, 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 sub 1% dregs of the universe that, are, that, are, that come from supernova explosions, neutron star collisions and processes like that. So the elements of life like carbon, oxygen are too small a percentage to even show up in this chart. And then we've got neutrinos, photons. So like the photons of the CMB are 0.01%. Then we have black holes. Now this might not be correct. And the argument goes back and forth, back and forth over many years is whether there are sufficient black holes to actually account for the 25% dark matter. And we don't need uh, anything else. So even though this class, the classic chart shows 0.005%, there's still an open discussion and debate in the community about what if this is actually a much larger number and um, dark matter could be explained by black holes. But right now, the um, the consensus is that's not the case. Of course, truth is not by consensus. Nature doesn't care. So maybe one day we will uh, we will determine that this is a much higher percentage. We're working on that with LIGO, for example, detecting gravitational waves from uh, collisions of uh, black holes. So this is now by itself the CMB. In order to pull out this uh, pie chart. This still doesn't stand by itself because you need corroborating evidence from different things like the like uh, supernova explode distant supernova explosions to get the dark energy percentages things like that in order to fit all the pieces together. And there's discrepancies here, like in the rate of expansion of the universe. You may have heard there's a there is a discrepancy growing between different measurements of 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 of, of looking at it. So we know this is not the end of the story. There's a lot more to learn here. And in fact, in the late 1990s, this pie chart would not have. Had had this dark energy would have had 95% or 80% dark matter and the rest atomic matter. And so as we learn and discover
discover more, we have to modify um, modify our understanding. But this is our current um, best understanding. But before launching into dark matter, um, uh, bef so there's still one more um, uh, one other piece of, of evidence we can look at that supports the concept of dark matter as being additional material and being matter that isn't traditional. It's something exotic. It can't be boring, you know, protons, neutrons, electrons that just happen to be dark, right? There are a lot of configurations that of, of ordinary matter that don't shine. But the thing is, if we take our um, computer simulations of the history of the universe and compare them to the real data, of the universe and the spread of galaxies in the universe, what we find is we do get a good match if we throw dark matter into our into the simulation without even knowing what it is, but just putting in matter that has gravity, but not necessarily any of the other forces. And so then what happens is, whoops, I meant to, let me see if I can, uh, it's not letting me play my video. Oh, there we go, missing the play button. So what happens is dark matter on the right in green, it collapses into pockets gravitationally. It collapses into the primordial wrinkles in space time from the beginning of time. And then it attracts ordinary matter, this gas and mostly hydrogen and helium that collapses to form stars, black holes, galaxies. And so this is a, this, there's a prediction here. So this is a falsifiable model is it shows that there should be some sort of clumpiness to the universe. And when we look in space, that's indeed what we see is we see clumpiness where we have galaxy clusters and voids. And the amount of clumpiness tells us the temperature of the dark matter. Is it hot? In other words, is it a light relativistic particle uh, such as an axion or is it a heavy cold particle um, like, uh, like, like the WIMP? And right now, the, the, all the astronomical data we have in astrophysical currently favors CDM, the cold dark matter uh, model, we, based on the amount of clumpiness that we see. So this bubble and void-like structure is observed in real data. So this is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, SDSS, and there's a lot more data now. And you see this like clumpiness. So dark matter just like regular matter produces gravity, collects, collects mass, and produce and it creates these this clumpiness in the structure, in the large-scale structure of the universe. And these voids then are created by the expansion, which um is which is accelerated by dark energy, the other large percentage. Now, I I I, I try often, I don't like getting um metaphysical too often, but I always point out, as, as I point out at the SCU conference, I can't help but notice that the structure of the universe looks just like the structure of a brain, not necessarily a human brain, but a vertebrate brain or maybe specifically a mammalian brain. That's always impressed me because if it's not a coincidence, maybe it says something structurally about the mathematics that form these two very different structures and very different scales. So I just toss that out there always for fun because the similarity is quite, uh, is quite remarkable. But now going back to um, modified uh, to modifying gravity is um, so we have to be um, a lot of scientists who work on dark matter with me are very very passionate that this is definitely um, the that we have the right answer but. If, like I say, if you know, if I had a nickel or a dime for every time someone sent me their one perfect right theory of everything, I would be able to have enough funding to self-fund my research without having to ask for to ask for money from the government. So we need to. I want to be open-minded about what are alternate possibilities. So one criticism of dark matter is that it's the new ether. And you may recall the Michelson-Morley experiment from the 1890s where it was demonstrated that the speed of light was indeed constant and the classical version of this idea at least doesn't work. And, but sometimes non-discovery of something is just as important as discovery, saying that we may need to adjust our thinking. So what could that be the case with dark matter? I, 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 I imagine that I hope that many of the people on this call follow XKCD, great comic strip, and um, – and here's his little joke, Department of Physics motto. Yes, everybody has already had the idea that maybe there's no dark matter. Gravity just works differently on large scales. It sounds good, but doesn't really fit the data. So the I, there, there was an idea for many decades called MOND, uh, Modified Newtonian Dynamics, that um, no matter how many knives and bullets it gets to the gut, it's a zombie and it just keeps getting resurrected. But um, it's, it's the idea that at very low accelerations where you have for distant stars far from centers of, of galaxies, 
that you would get a different law of gravity, a slightly modified um, law of gravity, and you don't need dark matter. Now, the issue there is that explains rotation curves very nicely. It does not explain the CMB, gravitational lensing, da 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 da, da everything else, large scale structure. It doesn't work. But furthermore, we tabletop experiments have been done with with um, with pendulums and with um, you know similar to like Cavendish style experiments and torsion balances. And there's no evidence of this modification uh, to um, uh, to gravity. That being said, we still got to keep keep checking just in case. So here is the latest data from the Gaia experiment, which is mapping the velocities of local stars, a great deal of stars near us. And the, the, the data is a significantly better match to dark matter than it is to modify, to, than it is to at least this version of modified gravity mon. Now, this but is, again, is dark matter, I put 99 plus percent, there are no 100 percents in science. There isn't math, but science is not math. Science uses math as a tool, but there's no such thing as 100 uh, percent in science. And, and recognizing, obviously, um, where I am today, oh, I, I should have said, and I'm, I really, I, I'm grateful to uh, Tim for his very kind uh, invitation today. So many, I know very, a great deal I'm sure that's an understatement. A great deal of alternative propulsion models and techniques require modifications to our understanding of gravity. So I'm throwing a bone here because there seems to be evidence now. I strongly recommend you take a look at this talk by Professor Sabine Hossenfelder from just a few weeks ago, where she points out now that in the last few months, almost an equal amount of evidence has piled up for modified gravity as for dark matter. And so there, and there, there seems to be um, a lack of the correct number, for example, of satellite dwarf galaxies. A lack of the correct density profile doesn't make sense inside of galaxies. So something weird is happening here because we have tons of evidence for dark matter and we have tons of evidence against modified gravity, but now we have, we have more evidence piling up for some modification of gravity being necessary. Now, why do why do do we say this still? Um, so it's almost equal, but you know that's not how it works, right? It doesn't matter. You don't count pieces of evidence, not how it works. But what's really interesting to me, we've also discovered galaxies that appear to have no dark matter. So that's weird, um, or a hundred percent. And so that is a that's a massive blow against just modifying gravity being correct. That's not possible because what, the, what that fact shows is that dark matter is indeed stuff that you can have more of or less of. But, but dark matter cannot explain several new pieces of evidence that have been coming in are better explained by modifying general relativity, doing something like MOND, but doing it better, like relativistically. And there are many, many approaches. So there are many alternatives to general relativity. There are the bimetric or Janus cosmological model, which Hassenfelder has worked on herself, There's which has a negative mass in the universe, which says there are positive masses, negative masses, and the negative masses explain dark matter as well as dark energy. There's the work of Philip Mannheim, University of Connecticut, a few hours south of me. There are different conformal gravity ideas. There are That is not an exhaustive list, obviously. I'm sure um, here at APEC, you've heard dozens of others. And these are on the table because dark matter does not explain everything. And so one of the ideas that's catching fire now is that we need to, we need both. We need both. We need a little, we need some modification of gravity, not as excessive as, as we would have thought decades ago. And we need to come to terms where there isn't as much dark matter as we thought, because you need both. You need modify gravity and you need dark matter in order to explain all the observations. But what's really interesting to me, if you look again at Hassenfelder's at a recent talk, is she points out that the vast majority of modified gravity theories predict a new field and that new field is quantized as a new particle and so we come full circle back to dark matter so even when you modify gravity you're often forced to in, invent new particles to, to from there and and that's not a new idea i actually heard that 15 years ago also at a conference at fermilab and that really impressed me that even if it's not dark matter oh yes it is again because it w most of the modifications of, of of gravity require predict a new particle so then we're back we're back again to uh, we're back again to new particles so um 
moving on now let's though say we do have new particles then and let's say we have uh what are they though we've just talked about the astronomical evidence and astrophysical what are they physically though there are a bajillion ideas that we don't have time to get into because i want to you know finish after an hour to have time for for an hour of questions so i'm only going to show some of the the, the greatest hits. And if your favorite idea is not here, just like if your favorite modified gravity theory was not on my last slide, I do apologize. I have to, I just got to be concise to finish in an hour. So I'm going to talk about just a few. I'm going to talk about WIMPs because that's what I look for. Myself, I'm going to talk about axions. I'm also mentioning hydrinos. That's by Mills of Brilliant Light Power. Because if hydrinos are dark matter, which is a modified form of hydrogen, that would just strengthen something I say later in my talk about the potential for dark matter as a, as a fuel source. But I'm gonna focus here on, um, on, on WIMPs and on axions. So on the left here, these are two potential models that are not dark matter models, but just give us dark matter. Give us as a kind of two birds with one stone, as a natural consequence. So the WIMP is a generic, acronym for our ignorance. It stands for weakly interacting massive particle. It is not one idea or theory or model. It's an umbrella term for our ignorance. And here are a couple examples of theories or models that have that produce WIMPs as a natural consequence. And one of them is supersymmetry. This is the idea that for every Fermion, there's a boson. For every boson, there's a fermion. In other words, for every particle with spin one half, there's a particle of spin one. For every particle of spin one, there's a particle of spin one half. And this is problematic, though, because um, you know we were hoping to have discovered it. Well, originally in the 1980s, Large Hadron Collider hasn't seen anything. And so supersymmetry, um, while not quite dead, many say is dead, is in real trouble. But it's still, why is it still going? Because it does have a lot of elegance to the idea mathematically, partially, like I don't care about supersymmetry for the sake of supersymmetry. I have no dog in that race because I don't care what dark matter is. I just want to find it. Um, or if it's not there and if it's modified gravity, I want to know that too. I want to know that, or is it a combination? But this is one of the prevailing ideas is that is the supersymmetry where you have these shadow particles, these super partners, which have more mass than the, original part, or than the original particles who they're paired with, like quarks and squarks and things like that. Now, why this idea is so elegant, even though it has no evidence uh, yet from an anywhere, is because this is a very analogous to something we already know and love, which is antimatter, you know, that we discovered in the 1930s. And so antimatter is analogous, except for antimatter, same electric charge, same mass, I'm sorry, same mass, opposite electric charge. And so here the idea is different spin but unequal mass. It's a broken symmetry in order to explain why we haven't observed this already. And th this idea gives you heavy new particles. So it gives you natural dark matter candidates. That's not my favorite, actually. I prefer actually a, a sort of maybe a better potential explanation or a source of WIMPs is extra dimensions. So on the lower left, if we imagine that there are extra dimensions beyond X, Y, Z length with height. A good analogy is you're looking at a garden hose and from far away, garden hose looks one dimensional. You look closer, you realize, oh, it has thickness, it's two dimensional. But then you look really close, you realize it's three dimensional, it's a cylinder, it's a 2D surface curled, curled up. So it's a flat surface, but curled up in a third dimension. So similarly, in order to explain why we haven't observed these extra dimensions macroscopically, is there's this idea this is called. This goes back to Kaluza Klein, um, uh, whom I really love. I especially love Kaluza, which is actually Kawuja, which means puddle in Polish. I'm a Polish American, so I really like um, um, uh, Kaluza or Kawuja. And when the idea here is, is though that the extra dimension to explain why we haven't observed it is curled up. It is. It is not just just like the traditional three spatial dimensions. It's not infinite in all directions and, and flat and linear, but has some sort of uh, curvature, such as a cylindrical geometry um, as illustrated here. And the consequence of that mathematically in quantum mechanics is that you would have a bunch of extra particles and that's called the Kaluza Klein Tower. And the lowest rung on that tower, just like with supersymmetry, could give you a stable particle, a stable new particle that could explain uh, dark matter could be, a, could be a wimp.
Now, completely separate from WIMPs on the right is the idea is that we have axions, which is a very different type of particle to explain dark matter where we have very light particles. They're, they're not very heavy, they're very light, and they interact with gammas or other forms of light with, with radio waves or thermal and different um, wavelengths and, and uh, energies of light. And uh, the way we look for axions are with RF cavities or microwave cavities. Um, and so I've often wondered, like, so for example, with the, um, due to the similarity of axion experiments with some of the like um, EM um, pulse, you know, thruster experiments, I wonder if, if, you know, some sort of coupling to an axion field might be involved to explain, to explain it because of the incredible similarities between the EM thruster designs and the detectors for, for axions. And now I want to emphasize, like I was saying with modified gravity, all of this could be correct. And it's because we might be oversimplifying, right? Dark matter does not have to just be one particle. It could be several different particles. I mean, why not? I mean, look at the standard model. We got quark this and lepton that and quarks come together and make protons and neutrons. And we have a whole periodic table. There could be an entire periodic table of dark matter. So a lot of, I know, theoretical physicists whom I know, I'm not a theorist. I'm an experimentalist. I have a, a screwdriver and a hammer and a wrench. I work in, in the lab. I'm not a theoretical physicist, but I know one of my, many of my colleagues in theoretical physics are, are often pushing for like their one idea. And I'm starting to think that maybe we, maybe dark matter is a rich sector and it's multiple and maybe all of these ideas are partially correct, um, including, uh, you know, extra dimensions. But let's focus in on, because it's the focus of my own research, let's zero in on that one dark matter particle candidate called the WIMP. How do we look for it? So we have different detection strategies. The main one is to look for what's called nuclear recoil. So you're waiting for one of these dark matter WIMP particles, if it's made of WIMPs, to come and bump into one of the nuclei uh, in, in your detector. Many different elements we use, xenon, germanium, argon, they all have different pluses and minuses as detection technologies. But the idea here is basically waiting for a billiard ball collision, waiting for dark matter come and knock into a nucleus in your detector. And that's called direct detection direct detection. And that's what I've circled in red here. That's where you're waiting for dark matter to bump in to some sort of standard model particles like protons or neutrons in a nucleus. That is not the only way though to look for WIMP dark matter. There's also direct production that's at the LHC where we bang particles together and try to make new ones from the energy from those collisions because of E equals MC squared. You can create new mass, new particles from the energy of those collisions. And then there's indirect observations where we look for dark matter to annihilate with anti-dark matter. There's antimatter for dark matter, just like ordinary matter. You've got ant matter and anti ant dark matter and anti-dark matter. And what if they come together? They could produce gamma rays, neutrinos. And so indirect observation is where we look for evidence, looking at the center of our galaxy, looking at other galaxies, looking at places of high gravity where we think dark matter should collect, and looking for gamma rays, neutrinos, et cetera, that would be consistent with some sort of dark matter signature based on different versions of the WIMP paradigm from supersymmetry or from Kaluza Klein. So, but I'm gonna, because that's what I work on, I'm gonna zero in on direct detection. And the trick with direct detection is it, ha it has the advantage of being the most model independent. So direct detection does not require that dark matter is this or that, it's supersymmetry or Kaluza Klein or this. It is one of the most gener generic search techniques because you're just, you just stick your detector underground and wait for something to bump, something to go bump in the night, something extra beyond all the naturally occurring radioactive backgrounds. But the disadvantage then of the direct detection approach is how do you know it's dark matter? And how do you know it's not naturally occurring radioactivity in your detector? And the good news is, is that most of the naturally occurring radioactivity is gonna interact with the electron cloud. So like gamma rays from the uranium thorium chain betas, things like that are gonna primarily interact with the electrons, not with the nucleus. And so that's one of the ways we disambiguate signal from noise, from background, is to differentiate between nuclear recoil versus electron recoil. So we think a dark matter wimp may, we may do nuclear recoil, but not electron recoil. 
That could be wrong though. So we do have experiments also looking for electron recoil. You see in my cartoon in the upper right, we want to make sure we don't miss the, miss the boat. And so there are many different techniques. I don't have time to get into all of them. Even within this one category of direct detection, there are a great many subcategories. So the experiment that I worked on for the last couple, um, for the last uh, decade, which has now been replaced by a bigger, better version of it is of itself is called Lux. So this is where you take a, a tank of liquid xenon, you place it underground. And the reason why liquid xenon is so great is because it interacts with radiation. And when a particle enters the liquid xenon, it produces light, scintillation light, through a physical chemical process in the xenon of atomic excitation, de-excitation, and ionization. It's, not obvious. it's far from the only substance that does that. All the other noble elements do it as well. Plastics, some organics have this property of so-called scintillation. So it's a very, very handy property, though, um, for not just dark matter detection, but anything. And I, it's funny. It's actually a huge coincidence. I think xenon is being considered. I'm sure you all on this call Sure, probably know that forwards and back. Xenon is being considered by NASA for ion engines. So actually, it's really funny because our my experiments, we have to compete with NASA sometimes. Well, we were worried we'd have to, but I think that project was killed, that we'd have to compete with NASA to buy tons of xenon. We wanted to look for dark matter. They want it for engines. And um, and so, th but so there's only the world production of xenon is only a uh, I think 40 tons a year because uh, it's unlike argon, it's a very, very small fraction of our, of the atmosphere. So the Lux detector was about 300 kilograms of liquid xenon. And the, there's a video that I'm going to play on the left, but on the right, that's a picture of me with one of my former students and postdocs, Jeremy Mock in the green hat. That's us in front of the Lux detector, which is basically a giant thermos in order to keep the liquid xenon cold. It's not, it's not as cold as liquid nitrogen, but it's pretty damn cold by about negative 100 degrees centigrade. Uh, or at least you need to get, depending on the pressure, you need to get at least a negative 90 to liquefy um, xenon at any reasonable pressure. And so that's a giant thermos. It's called a cryostat. It's made out of uh, titanium. And it's, so it's double walled. And that's where we, where it's, we liquefy our liquid xenon. And so... The um, let me play the video on the left. The concept here is is that you wait for dark matter to come bump into one of the xenon atoms. This this whole vat of liquid xenon is under an electric field, which I'll explain why why that's necessary. So you have PMTs, photomultiplier tubes, that are going to look for the ultraviolet scintillation light from the xenon. So the idea here is this dark matter is coming along. And the idea is it hits a xenon atom. You get this flash of light that is detected primarily in the bottom. But then you don't just have a flash of light. You also have electrons that are completely loosened and are liberated and then dragged by the electric field up to the top, where in the gas phase, they produce a second flash of light. So the time between the two flashes of light gives you the depth. The hit pattern tells you the radial position. So you have 3D position reconstruction. And the amount of light generated tells you the energy of the interaction. So that's the basic principle. This is only one of dozens of experiments around the globe. We've got a competing experiment in Europe. And um, I heard, um, I don't remember who, you know, I, when I called in a few minutes early, discussion was about China. China has an, has an identical experiment <laughs> to, to the one I'm working on called Panda X. Same idea, liquid xenon underground in China. And so this photo taken of me with my, with my colleague, Jeremy, we are nearly a mile underground in South Dakota in a former gold mine. We have to go underground because we need to get away from naturally occurring radiation like cosmic rays. The idea is, is that dark matter should pass through the rock, but that ordinary radiation will have a very tough time getting through a mile of rock um, in order to, uh, to reach the detector. So we know how to look for dark matter. Even though we haven't found it yet, we have dozens of ideas. If this technology doesn't work, we have 100 others. But how do we make it practical? So how, what, what, we have not found anything yet. So why do we keep looking? We keep looking because of the motivation from astronomy, from astronomy, astrophysics, because we can do a hundred, a thousand, maybe not a thousand, but a great deal of dark matter experiments can be done for the cost of you know, one missile in the Department of Defense inventory or for the cost of, the, of, a, of a large co a particle collider, you could do hundreds of dark matter experiments for that cost. So there are a lot of small, 
I don't know if I'd call them tabletop anymore because we are getting to the ton scale, but you know, they're my height, you know, these experiments, you know, liquid xenon is very dense. So these are small experiments that can have a lot of impact with, with, with a fraction of the effort of several other um, uh, uh, thrusts in particle physics, which, ha which have their own value. Of course, I'm not going to, I'm not going to crap on my colleagues who work on the billion dollar collider, but this isn't a billion dollar collider. You can build these really small experiments like Lux and LZ and they haven't found anything though is the downside so we the results from our experiments are put in graphs like in the upper left you have experiment a b c and we're just measuring zero with increasing precision so far so on the y-axis is the log of the interaction strength or the cross-section of interaction and the x-axis is the mass because we don't know what the mass is, so that's a free parameter. And so we have experiment A, B, C, so the experiments keep going lower and lower. And if you find something, then you put a blob um, on these axes in this parameter space. There goes your blob for where you think the mass and interaction strength is. Every single detection that's been claimed so far, though, has unfortunately been disproven has, or has not been reproduced at least. So every claim of positive detection of dark matter has been crossed by one of the, these lines that's, that have found nothing. And many versions of supersymmetry have been killed off. Um, and I know I have colleagues in theoretical physics who are not happy and I'm like, well, they're like, you, you killed my beautiful model. I'm like, well, your model didn't describe reality. Sorry, you didn't find anything. And so we keep looking deeper and deeper. And this is the cartoon on the left. But on the right is a real version of this plot. And so these lines up here are old experiments. And then the lines, the lowest lines here are projections of the next generation experiments like LZ that I work on that are taking over from Lux. And this orange you see here, that's when you, you build your dark matter experiments so big that unfortunately for you, it becomes a neutrino experiment. So neutrinos are awesome. There have been tons of Nobel Prizes for neutrinos. But the problem is, if you're looking for dark matter, you don't want neutrinos getting in the way. So the problem is, if you build a large enough experiment to look for dark matter, you start to get overwhelmed by the signal from, the signal from neutrinos. So we do kind of have a natural stopping point, uh, assuming we don't have a clever idea to improve the technology. It, we may be done in 10 or 20 years where not, where we've either not found we've either found dark matter or we've demonstrated that if dark matter exists it is beyond human capability at least as far as we know now to be able to conclusively detect it in the lab but now what will we do with this if we found dark matter so my big idea that's tied into um propulsion is why not gather it up to use as a propellant so there's so much of it so simple momentum transfer maybe as with a rocket uh, because dark matter is invisible it would look like a craft is violating the known laws of physics but it isn't really you would see propulsion without a propellant does that sound familiar to anyone so you seemingly violate in conservation of momentum but you're not it's just that your propellant is invisible to human sensors to our current technology so the idea is, though, I'm going out on a limb. This propellant idea is very speculative, very speculative. I have to emphasize, like I said, I didn't, I, you know, I was, I was hesitant to accept Tim's invitation today because I don't work on propulsion. I'm being completely honest with you. I just, I work on looking for dark matter, uh, but I just happen to also have this crazy idea that if we knew what it was and we could harness it, couldn't it be a, a propellant just by expelling it? Now, could it also be a fuel? Maybe. Probably not, because it probably only interacts gravitationally. But what if it does have some sort of weak other kinds of interactions? I mentioned earlier that could be a rich, dark sector of many different kinds of particles. So I think that should be on the table. The big if, though, is the number density of dark matter is unknown. So even though it's 25% of that pie chart, that might not be enough for it to be a useful propellant because the energy density is only 0 0.3 GeV per cubic centimeter in the Milky Way. So one GeV is one proton. So that's pretty pathetic. So even though there's th this density is quintuple that of ordinary matter, which is primarily hydrogen, this is still not very much. So 0 0.3 GeV per cubic centimeter might be a lot if dark matter is very light or if dark matter is very heavy, 
then 0.3 GV per cubic centimeter could mean there's one dark matter particle in my room and there's one out by Pluto's orbit and it averages out to 0.3. And so the problem is, is we know the energy density, but we don't know the mass density because we don't know the mass. So we don't know the number density. We know the energy density. We don't know the number density. So another problem is it almost does not interact at all. So how would you collect it? You can't collect it electrically because it's most likely electrically neutral. Because if it wasn't, we would see a different structure of the universe. We would see a, a different clumping of galaxies if there was some charge to dark matter. Now, there are ideas like so-called milli-charged dark matter, the idea that dark matter is electrically charged but very, has a very low fractional charge. But the vast majority of dark matter models uh, suggest that it would be electrically neutral. How would you gather it? So that's a big, big question. So now I know I'm running out of time, so I'm going to switch gears to dark energy that elephant of the room of 69%. So what the heck is this? So the idea here stems all the way back to Albert Einstein, who was uncomfortable with the idea of a dynamic universe. So the Big Bang Theory was originally originally invented by um, a Catholic priest, actually, Father Georges-Henri uh, George Lemaitre, not by Einstein. Einstein thought that the Big Bang was a stupid, terrible idea um, until uh, he was slowly convinced. So the, um, the idea, though, that Einstein tried to fudge things, though, with something called the cosmological constant to make the universe not expand. Uh, Einstein, he, Einstein called this his greatest blunder, but then in the late 1990s, Einstein gets the last laugh because it when we look very far away and very carefully at the expansion rate of the universe in the late 90s, start with an unprecedented precision. Um, at that time, we found evidence for the acceleration of the universe, ex, uh, the, the, ex, the rate of cosmic expansion accelerating. And so dark energy is the terminology for our ignorance. So dark energy is not its own hypothesis. It is just a label for our ignorance. We don't know what is causing this. The prevailing idea, though, is zero-point energy, where you have a material that has what's called an equation of state W of negative one. What does negative one mean? It means that the ratio of the pressure, P, to the mass density rho of this material is negative. So that, for example, it, it, it follows the opposite of Newton's third law. If you push it, it doesn't push back. It, it sucks you in. It's like reverse. It's like a reverse Newton's third law um, that dark energy follows. Very, very strange. Um, and if W is not exactly equal to minus one, then we devolve into these other scenarios where the universe uh, recollapses. Uh, re that's called a big crunch. Or if W is less than negative one, we have an even worse, more runaway expansion. Our current best data, though, says it's like it's negative 1.000. And so that's why the prevailing theory is that dark energy is the same thing as quantum zero point energy because quantum zero point energy is one of the only things we know of theoretically that has that equation of state, that very strange, it's not the only thing, but it's the main thing that we think of as having this negative equation of state. So how do we know this? How did we find dark energy? Oh. I can't help always dark energy. I make a joke from Star Wars. So that's Count Dooku producing force lightning. And he's a dark side user. So call that dark energy. So how do we know that? Um, I don't have time like I did for dark matter to get into the whole, the whole spiel like I did for dark matter. So I'm just hitting the highlights here for dark energy. And that is we looked at uh, supernova explosions. We looked at su distant supernova explosions in distant galaxies. And by taking a specific type of supernova called type 1a that we believe has a constant brightness that means if it's farther away it's dimmer and so we use that as a standard candle of brightness in order to estimate the distance and the uh, recessional velocity of, of of supernova explosions in distant galaxies supernovas are so bright that they can outshine an entire galaxy full of stars. And that's why we can see them billions of light years away. We think what happens with a type 1a supernova is that a white dwarf star explodes after sucking matter from a partner like a red giant. It's not the only way you can make a supernova. It's not even the only way you can make type 1a. But that seems to be the most common type. And because white dwarfs are so consistent in their iron and nickel content, 
That's why this leads to a fairly consistent brightness that can, that can then be used as a standard candle. So that's the astronomy. But just like with dark matter, now let's go down to the, the tabletop level. So if dark energy is the zero point energy, there are things we can do to study this. So the, the, um, we know the zero point energy is real because of Casmer effect experiments, but even decades before Casmer effect, we looked at, we could look at the lamb shift and that the lamb shift is the tiny change in energy level. It's much smaller than the Zeeman effect or the hyperfine structure. It's, um, much smaller effect than the, the hydrino energy levels, things like that. There's a very, very small difference in the energy level of the electron orbiting the hydrogen proton caused by the cl a cloud of virtual particles. So if dark energy is the same thing as zero point energy, it's not necessarily true. But if it is, then we have constantly particle antiparticle pairs zipping in and out of existence and they can produce even though it's a very small effect measurable forces measurable electric charges as with casmer plates so this is very potentially very exciting if we could find a way to harness this because one of the ways not the only way there are alternative ideas by bob rick and others but um uh, eric davis and hal putoff and um the original michael miguel cubieri paper suggests that if you could harness negative something that had negative mass energy or negative energy even temporarily this leads to the ability to develop real life warp drives faster than light or close time like curves. That's time travel to the past, one of my other favorite things. The, the problem is we don't know how to harness this yet on a macroscopic scale. Uh, if we could, this would be an incredible boon to propulsion because this would be the fuel you need for warping space time. But the problem is how do we scale this up? And the other problem is, is there's not even agreement that this is negative energy because that W of minus one, that's a ratio of P to rho. So it's the pressure that is most likely negative, not the mass energy density. So there's a lot of argument in debate, even in within the mainstream scientific community about could you even use dark energy for powering faster than light propulsion or powering your time machine because that is still controversial whether there is sufficient negative energy with the proper definition of what that negative energy means to make this work but i'm optimistic i'm optimistic that i'm hoping that this century that i'm hoping we figure this out um Dark energy, though, I have to say, because it's very important to be open-minded and look at all the possibilities. What if dark energy is not zero-point energy? What if it's something else? So one of the other ideas is that dark energy is a particle, just like dark matter. And in this instance, this is called the chameleon particles, one of these ideas. And the way you look for the chameleon particle is very similar to the way you test for modified theories of gravity, actually. Very similar. What you do is you take a tiny, tiny ball of something like uh, quartz and you look for additional forces beyond gravity, electromagnetism that you account for in your detector. And so here are some friends of mine. Actually, I, I heard a talk um, before the pandemic, I invited David Moore to give a talk. I know a lot of these folks like Giorgio Grata. And I love the fact that they started looking at this idea for how do we look for dark energy on the tabletop and not just out in space. And I'm very excited about these new ideas. So they didn't find anything either. If, if they did, trust me, you know, you would have heard it all over the mainstream media. But just like with dark matter, that doesn't mean the idea is wrong. It could mean you just didn't look hard enough and your experiment needs to be rebuilt better, be made, be made to be more sensitive. Now, the, 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 the idea, though, that dark energy is a particle, you can work out some math and see that it would have a mass energy of about 2.4 milli EV if it was a particle. You can do some very simple math to show that, and then that has a characteristic length scale. And I got so excited, this could be completely crazy, but I had to throw it out there, um, is that I, I, I contacted you know um, uh, Hal Pudoff when I realized this calculation because allegedly there are these so-called metamaterials that are recovered that the government allegedly has, it obviously was, if, if they're real, they're classified. They weren't mentioned in the report uh, from yesterday, but the length scale seems to match perfectly. So I started wondering what if these are metamaterials not for photons, which ordinary metamaterials that we make as human beings are for, what if it's for something more exotic, such as the chameleon particle? What if it's a waveguide for chameleon particles or 
for dark matter or for axion, you know, as something else. So I had to throw that out there because I just, I, I don't like all these coincidences. I feel like there's something, you know, that we're tasting some part of something really much bigger than us here. But um, we're coming up on the hour, so I'm going to conclude here so that I can start answering the questions. I see that it's piled up to 32 questions, which I hope we can get to all of them. Tim, so in conclusion here, I'll take just two more minutes to conclude then. So 95% of the universe is unknown. And even if that's wrong, let's say we have to modify gravity, that's still a discovery. That's still important. So we cannot claim that science is done and that there are no more patents. There's nothing to discover. There's plenty more to discover. However, one thing I must stress, it's a controversial point. What we do know, we do know very well. So for example, we're not going to wake up tomorrow and discover Einstein was wrong. and Relativity is wrong. It's too late for that because your GPS wouldn't work, et cetera. It's not going to happen. But we do know relativity is partially wrong. Quantum mechanics is partially wrong. It has to be. It's incomplete because we don't have a quantum theory of gravity, a theory of everything that everyone can agree on. Like I said, if I had a nickel for every time I got an email about someone's theory of everything, like there's no shortage of ideas. We don't know which one is right. We need to test them in the crucible of ideas with experiments and not just and not just theory. So in my own life, I, fo I focus on looking for dark matter using xenon-based experiments. So my second conclusion is, if we have all this dark matter and or dark energy out there, this, these are naturally occurring, potentially plentiful propellants for interstellar craft where you don't have to take your propellant with you. So, and you don't even need to do space-time metric engineering necessarily. In the case of dark matter, you don't even need metric engineering potentially. You could use it, quote unquote, the old-fashioned way as a propellant and using completely known physics. Now, the downsides of that is how would we harness it since dark matter by definition doesn't interact very often? And what would be the reaction be? It doesn't, it doesn't undergo any, any interactions as far as we know, except for gravity and maybe a very weak interaction where it can bump into nuclei like in the xenon detector, but at a very low probability. So I don't know how we could um, convert this into something useful, but what if there are all kinds of interactions that dark matter has with itself that's called self-interacting dark matter that we don't know about? And it's just like ordinary matter. Dark matter could have a whole slew of interactions that we don't know about and that we haven't discovered. I always like to think of what if dark matter is like antimatter or electricity, where we just don't have the imagination for what the potential practical applications could be. So in the example of antimatter, you know, in 19, when we discovered in 1933, it was just, just a curiosity, right? We checked the box. But nowadays, we inject people with very small, very safe amounts of antimatter for PET scans, positron emission tomography. And who would have guessed that? Who would have guessed that a century ago, nearly a century ago? And same thing with electricity, which runs our lives. There is a story which, you know, it's probably apocryphal, but there's a story that the King of England visited Michael Faraday in his lab where he's working electromagnetism, asked him, what is electricity good for? And Michael Faraday allegedly said, I don't know your highness, but someday you'll be taxing it. So I hope to live to see the day that someday we'll not only know what dark matter and dark energy are, if they're real, like I said, I'm be trying to be very skeptical and open-minded if they're real, uh, if we know what they are someday, I hope that it becomes a taxable you know, resource that powers our civilization. Um, so I'm going to stop there because we have 35 questions already. So um, Tim, I'll be happy to take questions now. Awesome. Well, Matthew, thank you. Thank you. So let, let me do this. And again, that, that was an amazing presentation, but I want to, let me see, I want to stop the sharing real quick. Mm -hmm. And and so I'm going to put it on gallery view. Everyone, please give Matthew Sadagas an enormous, enormous hand for a remarkable presentation. That was tremendous. Actually, was, some of those in chat, it wasn't 35 questions. He has some comments too. And people were okay. like, man, he, he just burned through so much stuff. So yeah. <laughs> um, let, let me let me just go to people. Let, uh, you know what? Let me go to Michael Boyd first because he, he was in here several times. Uh, Michael? Okay. He's I'll, still I'll, muted. I'll, yeah, yeah, I'll ask him to unmute. There we go. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Let's see. I let me go back. I had several questions, but I didn't. I just yeah, se several of those were yours, and that was why I went to you first because it was okay, kind of a stream um, there. 
first yeah, one I had is what is the difference in your your mind between gravitational lensing and gravitational frame drag? So yeah, that's a that's a great question. They are very intimately related. The frame dragging is speci refers specifically to what's caused by rotating bodies, whereas gravitational lensing is a little bit more general. They're both they're both though general relativistic effects that we know that we've measured, even though they're very small. So like, for example, we can measure the frame dragging of the, the sun or of the earth. And if you were in orbit of a rotating a black hole, you wouldn't need any propulsion, for example, because of frame dragging. You just cut the engines and just let the black hole carry you around if you're a rotating black hole. So, so gravitational frame dragging is related, but it's a specific subcategory that refers to rotation. It's an effect from rotation, whereas gravitational lensing, you don't need something rotating. You just have, here's a mass, and here's something going by it. And so, whereas frame dragging is more about things that are trapped in orbit around something rotating. So, I guess what I'm asking is, is there, in both cases, the light is changing frequency, wouldn't you say? So, in other words, so if you think back to that image you had of, what was it, that cluster where the two... Uh, yeah, the bullet cluster, there yeah. You had, and then you had a, a blue, and then you had the, what was it, red? Yes. Those were different spec. Those were different spectral wavelengths, correct? No, they weren't related. Actually, so the pink was X-rays, and the blue was was a direct measurement of mass from gravitational lensing. So the blue was not any sort of spectrum of wavelength of anything. It was an estimate of where all the mass was, um, based uh -huh. on the the gravity. The, so pink, the blue was the virtual. Pink was the yeah. blue was virtual, and yes. the, the red was a actual X-ray, which, which is spectral. Yes, it? exactly. So, exactly. so, but the but it showed the position of the uh, of what was being measured was there was a difference between the two, and it was, seemed like it was bipolar. You know, that's right. I mean? They didn't match. And one they one didn't. one direction was pointing in. And yes. It was like a, and then the other one was the opposite direction. Yes. So even though the stuff that was interacting was in the middle, correct? Yes. So the idea was that dark matter slipped out of the collision and formed those two blue lobes on the side. That's one explanation so my, of what you're seeing in the image. What I'm trying to suggest is yeah. that your space time is slightly different between electromagnetic space time, let us say, is different from gravitational space time. And that effect can be observed through lensing or it can be observed through uh, frame dragging. They're both the same thing. Yeah, if you okay. have rotating bodies and everything in the universe rotates, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's a really good point. property of space time. So more along how put us mm -hmm. yes. do, correct? Yes, yes, yeah, no, that's a really good point, Michael. Okay, and then that, then this is my, I'm looking at my other notes that I put in here. And so think of it as there's an inner, in an outer event horizon. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, for like rotating black holes have, yeah, two layers. So I mean, and think of it like our sun, mm -hmm. we have inner event horizon, the, the, the helisphere or whatever, and then we have an outer event horizon, the edge of the Oort cloud. Mm -hmm. And the same with uh, a galaxy also, this halo effect that you look at. Isn't that yeah. just a representation of an outer event horizon? Well, except that you can es well, you can escape. So so sure. you can you can you can escape. Yeah. But it's an I event do event horizon. It's a yeah. virtual, it's not a real, yeah. it's kind of like a, in a in a diode. Yeah. In the middle, in the band gap, there's this region where nothing gets through, they, a, a barrier. Mm -hmm. But it's only uh it's a in this case, in that case, it's a voltage barrier. But it's yeah, a no, physical material making it, right? Yeah, no, I have to think more about it, but yeah, that might be a good analogy. I've never thought of it that way before. So let me see. I think I had one other. Okay. Um, and then as opposed to the dark matter, dark energy, uh, how about gravitons and anti-gravitons? Great Gravit question. Oh, yes. Excellent question. So while we have discovered gravitational waves, it doesn't prove 
that they're gravitons. It does not. We have never observed a graviton, but the idea is, the hope is, is that if we had a quantum theory of gravity, we would hopefully see, oh, gravitational waves versus graviton particles would be different sides of the, the same coin. But yeah, the, uh, the, in the standard model of particle physics, the idea is, is that gravity is quantized as a graviton. And so what we observed as gravitational waves are bajillions, you know, trillions of gravitons coherently interacting. That's not necessarily the case. The uh, data that we have is completely explained by general relativity as just that gravitation waves are literal waves in the space-time metric. But the hope is, is that gravitons exist as well as anti-gravitons, because remember how I mentioned dark matter, anti-dark matter? Everything has an anti-particle. Unless, you know, if, if something is neutral, it could still have an anti-particle. I mean, the photon is its own anti-particle, but the neutron isn't because it's made of quarks. So just because a particle is neutral doesn't mean it doesn't have the anti-version. So if there were well, neutral isn't gravitons, neutron, depend, isn't yeah. a neutron, a proton, an electron, and a few and a neutrino? Essentially, it's it, there's no stable neutrons. Three neutrons decay, and that's correct. They, they have a half life of about we, eleven. We have minutes. protons yeah. that are free. We have free protons. Yep. yep. I mean, the, our whole our whole uh, universe is in a flux of protons. Yep, that that's, that, that's what, what what to form the muons is those relativistic protons hit the yep, atmosphere. That's correct. To form yep. the muons. So the it's so my so actually I, I, the, my last question now because I don't want to monopolize you. Yeah, time. you got to give other people a chance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm gonna okay. go to actually I'm gonna go to Jason next. Jason, I, I okay. see I, you've been hanging <laughs> on. <so. laughs> yeah, I see Jason there too. <laughs> Sorry, Jason. You need okay in the Casimir that that uh, experiment you showed with the Casimir mm -hmm. force, it it always shows two metal plates. Mm -hmm. Okay, does why doesn't it work with two pieces of glass? No, I think it does. I found papers on that. And also I noticed in the chat, people talking about different shapes. The only reason I showed the metal plates is because that's like the simple cartoon version. It is our technology and our Casimir effect has have advanced way beyond that. I yeah, just I've didn't have a chance to get into it. about glass. It's always has metallization. There. No, I believe there have been there have been other materials. I'm not 100% sure if it's glass, but I'm positive that non-metallic things have been looked at. I think the reason for metal is because you have particle antiparticle pairs like electron positron pairs and then you're essentially creating a miniature battery, a tiny very very tiny amount of force with a collection of the positive and negative charges. That's one way of looking at it at least. But I'm I'm almost 100% certain there have been oh and I just saw in the chat also explainable by van der Waal forces. Um no that's false. That's been disproven. So I it's agree. not classical van der Waal, van der Waal forces no no that's no, what no, atomic no. force microscope is yeah i that. mean we we know what van der waals forces are we can subtract them off we're not that bad of scientists <laughs> like it's not van der waals which would be really boring i'm sorry but zero point energy is conclusively proven what's so not I, proven I would request yeah. that yeah. if you yeah. if hear of something where you, you see a <clears throat> a paper where they're using yep. non-metallic materials. If I'm almost stuff. certain I'm going to have to dig it out for you. Or post yep. it somewhere. That would yeah. be cool. I'm almost certain I've seen it. I'll have and different geometries as well, which were mentioned in the in the chat. People have done wedges to get non-zero canceling torques. That's all been done. It's great stuff. Cool. Great. Stuff. Thank you for yeah. your time. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay. Th thank you, Michael. Yeah. Okay. So let me let me go to Jason next. Jason, thank you for your patience, sir. I think he's looking at how to unmute. I'm muting, I'm muting. Yeah. Hi. All right. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Can I make a quick comment on the Casimir thing first? I yes. just wanted to point out that you can get repulsive Casimir forces. Sure you too. can. And, uh, and yeah, uh, I read attractive. something about uh, an enhanced Casimir energy in metamaterial mimicking Rindler space. Is, yes. I thought that was interesting. But no, lot, to lots, my, of, lots of stuff has happened, yeah. So here's, here's this. I wanted your open thoughts on something because... Um, okay. As an alternative, or uh, in addition to, because um, you're mentioning modified theories of gravity. Yes. Um, perhaps we don't need to modify gravity, but rather modify how we use gravity in our models. And like your thoughts on how, I get nervous. Like, how like to simplify our calculations, we make approximations, and we could be missing out on certain 
effects, predicted effects. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, no, I know what you're talking about, Jason. You mean like the so you're talking about like heart and stuff? Yeah. So, yeah, no, a lot of the work we do in general relativity with gravitational simulation and stuff is we pretend everything is a point-like particle and electrically neutral. And often we do one-dimensional, which is complete nonsense. So the, So a lot of exotic effects may be possible. You're right with no modification even to understand gravity, but a modification to stop making approximations because the world has three dimensions of space and we have extended body effects like Abraham Hart's work, which I know you brought to my attention. So I do think that's very important and it may it may and be a guiding, a guiding principle towards helping us yeah. discover more exotic propulsion effects is we need supercomputers and we need to simulate our ideas because they're getting too hard. They're getting too hard. We can't write the analytic equations down for fully three-dimensional models with non-point-like particles. It's just too hard. And so a good, a good idea is to do computer simulations of the different propulsion models to, in order to test what they work. You still need the real experimental data, but theoretical uh, calculations as done by a computer instead of real theoretical calculations may make things easier for figuring out which ideas have, have a higher, prob higher chance of success. Uh, you know, Thanks. and Jason, thank you. And I, I should mention, Jason, you never have to be nervous at the APEC conference. <laughs> yeah. We we have a we have a firm commitment to being mellow and laid back. We we started this back, and actually, Mark Sokol approached me the, during the election cycle, right? And it was just like stress central. And he's like, "Man, we just need to do something else." I'm like, "Okay, so, so yeah, that's Thanks. yeah." We try to keep things super mellow. Okay, um, let me see who. Let's keep rolling. Yeah, who wants to go next? Who who has another question? We have a ton of them here. Uh, oh, uh, Remy. Okay, Remy, go ahead, sir. Hi. Can you can you hear me? Yeah. Hear yeah. You perfectly. Yeah. Can mm -hmm. you turn your oh, camera right, on, Remy? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you, uh, Matthew. It's a great presentation you gave here. Lots and lots of things. I think you needed probably two hours really yeah. to go for that. <laughs> um, now I'm I'm of the opinion. Um, when it comes to doing science, you know, a lot of people come to me and say, oh, this is wrong, that's wrong. I think science always, um, what's before is always an approximation of what's to come. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So on that point about relativity, yeah, I, I, I agree with you, um, except for the, the mon stuff. You know, maybe someone will find some other terms to add on to describe these really large scale effects. But um, do you think, do you, do you at all believe um, that? Relativity might be challenged by um, things like EPR. Do you, you, you think it will, will it be possible to to send information faster than light? Um, yes, yes. I think we're very clever as human beings, and I think there might be a loophole in there somewhere. So, so I think that what you're getting at, and correct me if I'm wrong, because we don't have a quantum theory of gravity, we know that general relativity isn't. 100% perfect and done. It's not. So yeah, no, what mm -hmm. I meant earlier is that you can't challenge relativity. Let me clarify that. What I meant is that relativity needs to be fixed. There will be add-ons. There have to be add-ons because relativity doesn't explain dark matter, dark energy, galactic rotation but, curves. We know it has to be modified. We know it has to be the, incomplete. The, the whole basis of um, space-time um, and the Lorentz transform and so forth if you were able to have a fast and light signal, you would be able to construct a system of rods and clocks that you could communicate throughout all space time. And then the, um, how to put it, the, the, um, the, the curtain would fall. Mm -hmm. You'd see something else. You'd, um, I mean, I've written some, some stuff where I believe that what you're doing, you could get rid of the retarded time terms in the Lorentz transform, and then you would find that you would find that somebody is absolutely slower than you, um, although because the, because the, the the transform is is uh, reciprocal, you would find that would be broken. Mm -hmm. And for instance, um, uh, to give an example, say in in the gravity field, it's an absolute fact that the closer you are to the source of the gravitating body, your 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 time dilation is 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 higher. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's no re re um, re re what's the word? reciprocity. There's no reciprocity. Reciprocity. Yes? Reciprocity. Yeah. Re reciprocity. Yeah. That's the word. So the further you are from the uh, gravitating body, the more your clock 
would tend to a natural speed, right? Mm -hmm. So I believe the same would be would be found in special relativity. So if you have two people moving, um, the Lorentz transform is set up as such that there is they they can't discern any absolute motion between them. But if you have a fast a, sig a signal that's faster than light, it would break that uh, reciprocity. Well, spe special relativity we already know is wrong. It's an approximation to general relativity because special relativity does yeah. not account for accelerations. So special okay. relativity is just a toy that you use when you have flat space time and no acceleration. Yeah. Well, but let's, in let's, yeah. let, let's keep it to flat space at the moment okay. on approximation yeah. of flat space. And no acceleration, um, yeah. Yeah, this is the idea that you can't discern absolute motion. Mm -hmm. You can't discern absolute time. What What are your feelings on that? If If um, there was a faster than light signal, what are your feelings on what would happen? What What would be the revolution after that? When someone says, "I can detect my state of absolute motion," what What do you think then would be the modification to special and general relativity? What would happen then? So that's an excellent question. I think what would happen is the same thing that happened with relativity and Newtonian mechanics. So I think that we need a bigger, better theory that allows for these possibilities because you're right, you've got quantum mechanics, EPR. And what I think would happen is it once we have a bigger, better theory that actually works, not just theoretically, but works experimentally, relativity would be the approximation you get from it mm -hmm. in the same way that you can approximate rel general relativity to get Newtonian gravity. So for example, you don't need relativity to get to the moon. Newtonian mechanics is good enough. And similarly, mm -hmm. relativity is approximation of something deeper. And yet one of the ways that relativity is almost certainly incomplete, very incomplete, is the notion of space-time as it's called codified in general relativity could collapse if you can allow for superluminal signals. So let's do another example related um, uh, to yours. So th things are already starting to fall apart in some ways in terms of this idea that there's no absolute motion, which uh, you know we all we're all taught, but I don't think it's completely correct. Because if you look at the cosmic microwave background radiation I mentioned in my talk, that gives yes. you already a preferred frame of reference from which you can calculate the age of the universe. And I, I've yeah. asked some of my colleagues this, I'm like, wait a second, because I'm not a theoretical cosmologist. So I asked my colleagues, I'm like, wait a second, if time is relative, why are we quoting only one age for the universe? Doesn't it depend where you are? And it's like, oh, well, blah, 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 blah. And so like yeah. the, the cracks are already starting to show where I think that we can't dismiss the possibility that there could actually be a preferred frame. I mean, Einstein desperately yeah. wanted to put something like that into GR. It didn't work out. Um, but maybe there is some sort of preferred frame. I mean, I'm still skeptical, but I'm open to the idea because of the example I just gave from the cosmic microwave background does seem to illustrate without even anything superluminal. But on, yeah, on, a, yeah. on a, yeah. a sorry, sorry to interrupt, but on, on a sort of philosophical level, I mean, events have to happen somewhere mm -hmm. um, in, in relativity. You can't even agree where, where an event happens, mm -hmm. just on the philosophical level. Yeah. Something happens somewhere. Yes. yes. It's all this question of um, the the um, the causal delay, the the retarded time, and yes, people's placement of where such an event happens. If you have faster than light signaling, which is literally, as as far as we know, it's literally instantaneous. Um, mm -hmm. it, it would have to be for reasons of um, conservation of probability um, when when the wave function collapses. Um, mm -hmm. All, all, all experiments seem to say that the effect is instantaneous. You could yes. absolutely agree. All observers could agree that something took place somewhere. Um, on this on this matter, I'll just um, give a give an analogy that I talk to um, uh, let's, let's say to people. Um, it's a bit like a situation that if you have in a cave, you have bats, and they locate each other by echolocation, and then some one they've got the, the eyes are very atrophied. And then one day someone switches on the lights and the bat says, oh, I get it now. It's just a time delay for me sending signals. Mm -hmm. But you, you, you're shining light in here now. And there's me sort of, um, what's the term they use in, in navigation? Um, is it second guessing or when they estimate the path? You know, like battleships. Where they, oh, they yeah, yeah. No, I know exactly what you mean, like projecting based on the last yeah. known point of yeah. motion. Yeah, yeah. 
and they would just see it, it would become immediately apparent dead reckoning. Dead, yeah, dead okay. reckoning. Yeah. That's that's the term. Yeah, and it would be it would become immediately apparent to them that they were simply just using the slow signal um, for a, a phenomena that goes at that particular speed. But now they have this extra tool. They can say, ah, you know, all the uh, the scales have fallen from my eyes. From mm-hmm. our eyes, we can see what's going on now. Um, that's my viewpoint on it. Um, I'll, I'll show hand over anyway. I don't want to hog, hog the session. Yeah, it would be a major. Yeah, it would be a major revision of how we view the universe. As of right now, we know of a whole list of things that can go superluminally that don't break any of our known laws. But the catch right now mm. is that, for example, with EPR, we can't send a signal. We can only send noise. I'm cautiously optimistic. Mm. We're humans and we're smart. And maybe we'll meet non-human intelligence is smarter than us. Well, on, on I'm that, cautiously um, optimistic we'll find a way around it. I don't. Yeah. I, I I haven't seen any evidence now, but I'm cautiously I can, optimistic. I can show we'll you some. I can show you some yeah. papers. I mean, I have dealt with the um, the founders of the No Communications Theorem, and they have. They, um, I, f- I found a flaw in it. Mm-hmm. There are flaws. Um, absolutely. To, yeah, yeah. I, I could share some papers with you later. It's a very simple thing that they've missed. Yes. And uh, I, I think it's what they call cognitive dissonance. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So maybe if we talk later, because we, we, we're just trying to set up an experiment to, to prove all this. And it's really quite straightforward. What yeah. the, um, it, it, I mean, Remy, instance, Remy, I'll, I'll give you, go on. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry, Remy. Um, w- would you want to paste your email into chat for him? Or, or I yeah, I, I can do that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Or I could send it. I could send it if you want. Yeah, and, yeah. Mike, oh, and Michael's stupid. right in the chat. Quantum tunneling does so superluminal, and that's what I was saying to Remy. I'm cautiously optimistic that we're going to figure out a way to make it um, make it possible to send a, a, an actual useful signal. We can't today, but maybe we will. Maybe soon. Maybe it's not going to take a hmm. century. I'm very this optimistic. Is all this, um, it's all this key on. point about when the when the wave function collapses, that you'll just get yeah. noise. But there, there is a way yeah. around that. Um, oh, I would love. Um, how do I have to put it? So, um, I, I, I would be thrilled to, to. I would be thrilled yeah. to, to, to learn that. But I think we have to move on to other people who want to ask. Yeah, let's move on now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah. Thank pleasure. you, Remy. Thank you for your question and your very thought-provoking uh, comments. Okay, thank you. Um, so let me go to let me go to Will next. I think Will, you you had your hand up for a while. <clears throat> um, in your. Uh, presentation you said that space cools up i actually agree with that and uh so if we consider that as, at some dimension i suppose around the sixth dimension that space is curling up so there's no way we could actually um, visit the higher dimensions because we're cut off by the I believe it's what 10 and minus 24, 20, 23, something like that. Um, so could we then infer then that actually the uh, dark matter is a larger uh, reflection of our visible universe because your simulations seem to indicate that. So, yeah, there are a couple different possibilities with the curled up extra dimension. So one of them is the that I mentioned is that there is a when you have a curled up extra dimension, if it has this like periodicity to it, one of the consequences quantum mechanically of this, the Kaluza Klein Tower, where you have copies at increasing mass based on the radius of that curvature, you have copies of all the known particles at increasing mass. Uh, But another possibility actually is that dark matter is just ordinary matter and it's hiding in the extra dimension inaccessible to us. And because if gravity is the, is the geometry of space time, then maybe gravity bleeds out into all those extra dimensions. And so we might be feeling the gravity of ordinary matter. It's nothing special. It's still protons, neutrons, electrons, but it's hiding in an extra dimension. And that's called the randall Sundrum model. So that's another possibility. I'm not sure if I addressed your question, though. Did I? Is that satisfactory? No, I, think, I, th- yeah. I think that's about right. We get, but but uh, yeah, so we could say that the, that the dark matter is a, even if it's ordinary matter, 
you know, we're still cut off from it by the curling up. Potentially. I would be disappointed because then we might never get to it. We might never probe it directly. It might be beyond us. Yeah, so that would be sad, but that's a possibility. But it seems to me that even if it's curled up, it still would be leaking something into our universe. Yeah. And we could infer by your detectors, for example, uh, what's on the other side. So... Yeah, the, 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 the hope is is there would be a non-zero leakage from the extra dimensions, gravitationally at least. That would be the hope. But it could actually be exactly zero. I don't think so. There's no such thing as zero and 100% in real life um, in science. So, so I, I'm optimistic that we would get some leakage even in such a scenario. Yeah, so I was thinking that maybe one of the reasons why you have 100% in one area and 0% in the other area is because it's so much more massive than, than our visible universe that it wouldn't actually, you know, because our, our universe would be smaller, it wouldn't reflect in the areas where there's zero, there's no reflection. So yes, yes, there should be nothing to interact with in those right. areas. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, gotcha. And that, that seems to me what your simulation actually is, is saying. Yeah, the computer simulations are very general. They don't care what dark matter is. They're just simulating pockets of gravity, which could be explained many different ways. They're very generic. Mm. Anyway, that's 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 what I wanted to say. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Okay. Thanks, Will. Uh, Let let me go to Sky Huddleston next. Sky. Okay. Uh, Yes, I have a question, and this is a general question. Have anybody has anybody here ever considered looking into plasma-based cosmological models and electrical-based cosmological models like those espoused by Dr. Don Scott and Walt Thornhill. Their models are very controversial, but controversy when it comes to bleeding-edge science oftentimes proves to be good. Look at Galileo and Holt and Arp and so forth. Um, <clears throat> so ultimately what it comes down to is, is, it, is anybody considering that maybe perhaps our fundamental interpretation of physics based off of general relativity could be predicated upon axioms that may in fact be false. And also, um, <clears throat> are, is anybody here aware of plasma-based cosmological models and electrical-based cosmological models? And if so, do they have any speculative ideas on how we can exploit these new understandings of physics and interpretations of the universe to actually create superluminal vehicles? That's a great question, Sky. I think you'll be disappointed with my answer, but I have to give you my best answer, which is I have looked into it, and plain and simple, they're they're just wrong. They just don't fit the data. And it's not that like, oh, I'm not, you know, I don't want to say, you know, I'm not open-minded enough or something that physics is wrong. They're just plain wrong. They just don't fit the data. So a good example of that is the discovery of gravitational waves, which cannot be explained in the electrical plasma models. I looked into this, but it matched perfectly the predictions from general relativity. So while the models were interesting, the thing is, is that they don't match the data. So to me, um, a great idea, even if it's it, just because it's controversial, doesn't make it wrong. Absolutely not. Lots of ideas were originally controversial and turned out to be correct. But when data set after data from astronomy, cosmology, say, nope, it doesn't match, it doesn't work, it's wrong, wrong, wrong. At some point, as a scientist, I have to, I have to draw the line to be like, well, I'm not going to spend time on that because it's probably wrong. There's always the tiny chance it's right, but because there's only 24 hours in a day and like I have to focus on what I think still has a possibility of being right. I've, I've personally written it often as have many of my colleagues because it just doesn't seem to match the real experimental data. And we could, I know we could argue hours about it about, and you could send me hundreds of pages of papers that say, Oh, look, it works, but it doesn't, frankly, not after LIGO, not after detection of gravitational waves Um, in LIGO, which in my opinion, were the nail regarding LIGO. Yeah, I don't trust LIGO, not because of, the, of their science, but because of their finances. LIGO was a, about to be shut down six months after 30 years of non-performance or 20 years or however long they were operating. And they actually broke protocol and actually started to communicate with the other gravity wave detection facilities. And I suspect that they may have actually fabricated that evidence to keep the uh, the gravy train of money coming in. 
it, it, but if that was true, then they wouldn't have had incidents where gravitational waves were, were detected simultaneously with photons, with gamma rays and, other, and neutrinos. So what you just said might have been true if they had only one event and it was only them. But there have now been consistent detections that are simultaneous of it's called multimodal, you know, astronomy of gravitational waves with electromagnetic radiation with neutrinos simultaneously. So it'd have to be a giant conspiracy of all these different experiments, um, some of whom were perfectly secure in their funding for decades. So it just doesn't make any logical sense to me. Let, let me ask you this. Has LIGO isolated out and the, the other experiments coming there afterwards, have they isolated out scalar waves as a possibility to explain this phenomenon? Um, the term scalar waves can mean many different things. Can you clarify more what specific model of scalar waves you're referring to? Extremely high frequency um, Zanecki waves. I think that's how it's pronounced. Give me a moment. Xenix waveforms. Well, I so think, Zenic wave. Zenic. but it would be. Sorry. Extremely high frequency Zenic waves. But I don't think that would explain when you have you have their det gravitational detections of black holes with colliding with black holes, black holes with neutron stars, neutron stars, neutron stars. We have so much different variety of detections now from different techniques that the more detections that have occurred, the more it piles up to look like the class the classical expectations from general relativity. Now hold up, how do we know that these objects are actually black holes? and not plasma toroidal structures. Well, it'd be a pretty massive coincidence that they match Einstein's predictions from 1915 then, 100 years later. I mean, they could be, but that's a pretty it's, massive coincidence. Every, everything that black holes can do, so too can plasma toroidal structures because we've done it in the lab. But, but how do you form plasma toroidal structures naturally in nature when black holes are caused by the gravitational collapse of stars? Well, you can form, I mean, Plasmatorial structures can be formed by a, a multiplicity of methodologies, including very complex Birkeland currents interacting with each other to form tendrils to create toruses. Um, how would they, that, they, they, they can do this through matter bridging. But how would that explain the image of the event horizon that we got from the event horizon telescope that again matches the prediction of general relativity for a supermassive black hole at the center of that galaxy. We saw the event horizon and we saw the Doppler shift of the different sides, plus the orbits of stars in our own galaxy. I mean, I could go on for hours and hours. There's right, right, right. Yeah. And, and look, yeah. I'm just saying, I yeah. think it's an axiom. I think it's an axiom that Einstein was right. I think we have to do more testing. I think and for take for example, comet trail hold comet trails. Comets were long thought to be icy snowballs. We now know that they're not. And the methodology by which their trails are created are currently unknown. Their tails, their trails, whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. Um the Halton ARP has actually illustrated, take for example, the exponentially expanding universe hypothesis. This is called inflation hypothesis. Inflation hypothesis is predicated upon the Doppler effect which is the idea that as objects move away from you, their wavelengths of light or sound, irrespective, uh, any wave, wave, wave energy, as, as the source propagates away from you, the waves become relatively elongated, just as they become compressed as they come towards you. And it's explained that the red shifting call, that we see in the furthest reaches of the cosmos is due to the Doppler effect. The problem is that Halton Arp, who was the protege of Sir Edwin Hubble, continued his work through and into the 1980s and effectively proved by observing various quasars and stars and redshifted stars that were connected to each other via matter bridges that were redshifting when they should be blue shifting and blue shifting when they should be redshifting and their distance was verified using um, uh, what's it called when you take two points in the Earth's orbit around the sun to measure a parallax. parallax. Using par Stellar parallax. parallax. Yes, parallax. Thank you. Uh, parallax. So Holden Arp verified the distance of these objects using parallax, the most reliable methodology of garnering distance, not redshifting. And he found objects that were redshifted connected to other objects that were blue shifted via matter bridges, and he verified their distance using parallax. So cosmic redshifting has nothing, as far as we can tell, there's no evidence other than an axiom that redshifting is due to the Doppler effect.
Look, but that's a separate issue. All that says is relativity is incomplete, not that it's wrong. It's not an axiom. Relativity is, is buttressed by experimental yeah. data. If relativity is wrong, your GPS wouldn't work. It would put you in the middle of the Atlantic in a few minutes because that, you have to compensate for the gravitational redshift. So, no, no, so no. that relativity... You're confusing, clock, you're confusing clock dilation with time dilation. No, I'm not. Clock there's dilation. three effects. There's gravitational redshift, plus there's special relativistic dilation of speed, plus there's the gravitational effect from being farther from the center of the Earth. All three have to be compensated for, for GPS to work. So if relativity was wrong, stop using your GPS if you don't believe relativity. So no, relativity no, no, no. is incomplete, but it's not wrong. Incomplete and wrong are different. What I'm yeah. saying is that relativity yeah. may be a byproduct of a much more fundamental force. Yeah. Oh, well, that I agree with. It is for sure. It is for sure. It is. But the thing is, what the experimental data says is that relativity can't be completely wrong. It has to be at least partially right, or else our technology wouldn't work. That's all. That's. I think we're having more of a philosophical. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Scott, I'm not Scott, sure about that. I Scott, think I, I think those are axioms. I think yeah, we have to yeah. do more testing. Yeah, Sky, let me, and, and what I would suggest is for this, because you guys are getting pretty deep on this one, I would suggest emailing e emailing Matthew. And, and then that's probably the best way because- Let's give other people a chance to ask questions as well. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 But thank, thank you, you, Sky. Yeah, thank you, Sky. Yeah. Oh, okay, um, so let me see. I, and we had a, a bunch that kind of scrolled through here. Uh, Remy and Sky, and again, thank you, Sky. Um, so who, who is next on our questions list? <laughs> I saw a hand go up, Alex. Oh, um, hey, Alex, would you like to go? Uh, yeah, okay, there we go. Just a quick question. Okay. So um, what do you think about the number of increasing free parameters in the standard model being a symptom of a Kuhnian crisis in, in, in the whole area? Oh, that's, thank you very much for your question. I love Kuhn and his work um, on on the hit, on how scientific paradigm shifts occur. So, thank you very much for your question, Alex. Yeah, I think that so the the there are so many things. Um, so I, I don't remember who it was. I think it was Richard Feynman, but I might be accidentally misattributing this quote. But I think Feynman said that as a good scientist, the approach you have to take is you, you come up with a theory, it works, experimental data, and then you work to prove yourself wrong as fast as possible and find out a better idea. You're absolutely right. So the standard model has there, it works extremely well, but it cannot explain dark matter, dark energy. There's the G minus two result recently from Fermilab. And so like and the the a common misconception with the large hadron collider in Europe is that the goal is is to spend money to prop up the standard model the opposite is actually true is the money's being spent to try to find where is the standard model wrong because we there are severe issues with it we need to replace it with something what is that something is it you know there's too many options. There's string theory, loop quantum gravity. We've mentioned all these different ideas today alone. And I mentioned in my talk, we don't know what the right replacement is. But so many anomalies are piling up. You're right. And I believe what Kuhn said is you have enough anomalies and then then you've got the paradigm shift as the anomalies pile up. The anomalies pile up first and initially they're brushed under the rug. So right now we've got the G minus two anomaly, which is very serious. We have the Hubble's constant anomaly in cosmology. We have um, the proton radius mystery. And so I think a lot of these anomalies are piling up, piling up. And hopefully it's getting to the point where we're finally going to be able to move towards something where we realize standard model, general relativity, all these things are really approximations of a much bigger thing, a much deeper truth. Um, the problem is we don't know. There are so many arguments back and forth of which potential theory of everything fixes everything. We don't know which one yet, but these anomalies are really starting to pile up, um, Alex, right now, and, and, it's, and they're getting very, very serious. Yeah, I agree with you that the experiment is really the, uh, the ultimate arbiter of what's, what theory, what pet theory is going to be the right one. Yeah, yeah. Well, th thank you, Alex. Thank you. Um, thank you. Great yeah, presentation, by you, the way. Alex. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for your question. Yeah, and let me see. I just let me see. I just saw another one. Oh, Jason has his hand raised again, sir. Yes. Am, am I unmuted? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, sir. Yes. Um, so, hi, Matthew. Um, the first talk was on mass modulation, and 
um, the ability to modulate mass in general could open doors for propulsion. What's mm -hmm. your view on, there's a lot of different ideas, but what if there's anything that comes to mind, there's like Woodward and there's Abraham yeah. Hart, and then there's the talk from this morning and just thoughts on changing mass because the if yeah, mass is no, constant your equations of motion. You, you can't really, it opens yeah. doors if you could change. No, mass. I have several ideas on that. And I apologize that I didn't see that talks as might've been mentioned. Cause you know, as I told Tim, when he invited me, you know, I'm packing for a trip tomorrow and I got to leave at seven, got to eat dinner. You know, my wife's going to kill me. So I apologize to both the speaker before me and the one after me uh, that, that I'm not there, but yeah, here are my own thoughts without having heard um, what was said, which is my own thoughts from what I know. I can think of right off the top of my head, a couple different ways that you could modulate mass. Um, one, one is the idea that you know if the if the Higgs boson is indeed the reason for the majority of mass, if it if it leads to the mass of the quarks and proton, if there was some way to shield or screen the Higgs mechanism, you could reduce the inertial mass of something. I have no idea how you do that, but I think that it's a crazy idea that's worth thinking about. Um, another possibility is. Um, um, another idea is what if is the ex extended body effects you mentioned, you know, we know that the effective mass changes relativistically, right? And we always talk about it with the Lorentz factor and special relativity, but we forget general relativity, right? You could, you could have crazy objects that have a different mass in X and Y and Z. We hate thinking about that because it's hard, but just because it's hard doesn't mean it's impossible. Remember, I'm sure this group here at APEC will very much appreciate the fact that I know of quotes from 100 years ago where two weeks before the launch of Sputnik, some astronomer said space travel is impossible. And, you know, in <laughs> 1901, some astronomer said air travel is impossible. And so I, I think it's very important to keep an open mind about these crazy mass effects because there might be something to them. It's going to be really difficult, I think, to do, but difficult and impossible are not the same thing. So I do think there's some merit to this to these ideas of modifying the inertial and or gravitational mass of something. Let's not forget also, let's, let's say for the sake of argument, we have no evidence of this, but let's say for the sake of argument that gravity is transmitted by gravitons, okay? We have no proof of that, but let's say for the sake of argument it is. What if you could screen or block graviton some way. I mean, we block photons all the time, right? With electromagnetism. I mean, we block photons, right? You know, the light, the light in this room can't go through my skin, oh, except partially, right? It's translucent, but it's mostly opaque. And so maybe there is some sort of like gravity opaque materials. I, I don't think that's crazy. And I think we need to, we need to take big risks and explore like you like the like people are doing here at APEC and take big risks and try to explore some of these ideas because they might have some they might have some merit and they're worth uh, the risk exploring. So those are my thoughts on that, Jason. There's a quote actually. Um, you mentioned space quotes. It was either Wilbur or uh, um, or Orville Wright that said to his mm -hmm. brother like a few years before they achieved flight that man wouldn't fly for fifty years. Yeah, <laughs> I heard and, that from and, Tyson. And, yeah, and, and it thought, was um, the royal was astronomer, sir, I think it was Harold Spencer, said, maybe we'll get to the moon, but not in my lifetime and not 100 years from now. And then in 1969. So, so yeah. I, I think we have to be very careful to distinguish between difficult and impossible. Yeah. And what we sometimes used to think are impossible, like earlier we talked about superluminal, mm. we're starting to find exceptions, 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 exceptions. So, um, but I think we have more questions. And Jason, you, you could always wait, just wait, ask one, me later. Yeah. You can always, I know, and I do, I do, I do. Wait, one, one more yeah. thing, because um, yeah. you guys are talking about uh, superluminal and, and, but FTL, does that guarantee time travel or not? Because I don't think that the two have to go hand in hand. Quantum FTL does not guarantee time travel. No, it doesn't. So for example, quantum tunneling does not guarantee time travel. Only if you push the uh, special relativity too far. Yeah, if you so, push so it past yeah. the validity limits of the of the theory, yeah, then no, you'd say, "Oh, I you can travel in time." To, I used to think faster than light was synonymous with time travel. No, it's not. it's not necessarily the case. We have to be very careful and very specific of what type of FTL we mean. We have to be very cautious and break it down. Okay, okay. that's it. So, well, th thank you, Jason. Um, you so, welcome. actually, Thomas Anderson, I, I haven't seen I haven't seen Thomas in, in months. Uh, Thomas, would you like to ask, sir? Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, and welcome, welcome back. Myself. Welcome back, Thank you. sir. Thank you. Uh, I, I was just curious. Um, are, are you aware of like this uh, recent 
like uh, I guess data input where they were basically watching this gas cloud approaching the supermassive black hole at the core of the Milky Way. Yes. They expected it to be absorbed and instead it just kind of drifted through with a slight distortion. And, uh, you know, maybe the possibility that the end of a black hole ultimately is that due to, you know, energy release through whatever means, whether it's Hawking radiation or whatever, if you start starving it of new material to generate thermal energy, the material inside, as we know, with compression of things, they get colder because they can't hold on to the heat. They get hotter than the surrounding environment and bleed that heat off, getting dropping down to the surrounding environment's temperature. If you get that uh, effect in a black hole where basically no new heat's being added to it, is it possible to get cold enough that eventually it stops interacting with the surrounding environment to the point where it becomes dark matter? Yes. And then, and then Think, falls apart into yeah. you know quantum foam, or uh, basically yeah. in the case of dark matter, it's super dense quantum foam. Yes, thanks for bringing that up. I didn't have time because, again, I just went I, – I had way too much material for an hour. I am aware of that result. I've looked at that. I find it incredibly exciting because it, what it says is maybe, maybe the heart of every galaxy – is not a super black massive black hole as we thought, or as you just said, maybe supermassive black holes, they evolve over time. You're absolutely right. And this is so exciting to me. This is when paradigm shifts happen and good science gets done is with this anomalous data. The data is not consistent with there being a black hole at the center of the Milky Way. It is not consistent with Sagittarius A being a black hole. And one of the ideas I've heard is, yeah, it's a clump of dark matter. That is incredibly exciting because that's when we move forward is not when and we have confirming data, but we have like, oh, hey, what's that? Kind of right. like when, when, when I, I, Rabbi said, when the muon particles discovered, he said, who ordered that? It completely threw everyone for a loop and really blindsided everyone, this new data. And I'm, I personally find it incredibly exciting. And I really hope we're going to learn more about whatever the hell that is at that, the that, center nice, of the Milky nice, Way. Yeah. Nice second moving away so that the sun actually, you know, blinded out or you know washed out your screen oh, right as yep, you said blindsided. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah actually you know what I was, was it sounds like you need to do a part two then he needs to come back <laughs> yeah, it, it, well, well it, i'm really it, excited thomas thank you for bringing up the uh that new data because that's hot off the presses that's yep. fresh stuff and that's it's well, really exciting yeah, yeah I, I should add to my my supposition is that if you have galaxies constantly forming these supermassive black holes that eventually they get starved and turned back, in, back into dark matter that gets reinvigorated and then you know sp after spreading out and becomes another mass that eventually collapses to form another galaxy another supermassive black hole over and over again for you know hundreds of, of billions of years that would create the same kind of uh, random very very minute fluctuation in the differences of our cosmic background radiation just as easily as like this big bang theory mm -hmm. which means we could have been going on much much longer so. no you're absolutely right uh, that's wonderful thank you thomas for bringing up that the bringing that up i had neglected to mention this new data yeah ha thank have you. you had a chance to do any actual uh sit down and actually do any lab experimentation of your own or is this all just having to you know go on basically uh picking through the data of already existing experimentation and trying to piece the put the pieces together as you know most of us are doing Oh no, I've um I've in I mentioned the Lux experiment now being replaced by LZ. The dark matter detection experiments I've I've helped build. That's my that's my job is building those experiments, deploying them underground in South Dakota. So like I said at the you know, at one point in my talk, I'm not a I'm not a theorist. I'm actually not that good at, at math, to be honest, which is strange for a physicist to say. I'm actually more comfortable with the screwdriver, a hammer, and a wrench. Like I said, is I and, and, and looking at the graphs after you do the F exactly analyzing the data, the and right. I do do some computer simulation as well and compare results to computer simulation. But I'm not really a theoretical physicist. So I, for example, I like I said earlier, I have no horse in the race. I don't care if dark matter is something different than what the theorists tell me. I don't care. I'm an experimentalist. I don't care if dark matter is wrong and we have to modify gravity because that's great. That's science. We learn. So uh, to me, I, it's about tinkering in the lab. And I don't just work on my Lux and LZ projects. I didn't get a chance to talk about today. It's not related to propulsion. But I've also done some cutting edge work on super cooled water, which actually I know some of the people here today will be happy to hear is, look, 
I agree with many of you that some of the peer review process in science is broken and some good ideas don't get the time of day. It took me four years to publish my paper on supercooled water because journal after journal after journal thought it was garbage. It's not garbage. It's a major discovery, but no one believed me. So I am sympathetic even when I said to some people, oh, your model is wrong. I looked at it. Believe me, though, that I am sympathetic to many cases where Turns out it was right, but the, the but journals didn't listen. I am sympathetic to those situations because it happened to me. Because I build experiments, I get data, and then I need to and then I, I need to try to publish that that, that data. Yeah. Well, well, Thomas, thank you. Let, let me go back to Michael Boyd. We've got about nine minutes left. So, okay. Uh, I don't know how to turn my put my hand. Can you? Put there my we hand go. Oh, I, I've got it for you, sir. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, I have two 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 uh, questions. Um, one basically has to do with the design of the experiment. Um, uh, I saw your. I, I've worked on uh, optical uh, testing on surfaces, and and it, and it looks like your detectors are basically uh, specular. In other words, you see a light; it's going to be looking down or up. And I'm curious if you have any detection on the side for like scatter. Because oh, the, the, yeah. the, my, my, my curiosity is because the, what the light you're looking at, if it's in the wrong phase, you may not see it with your detector because it's, it's, it's operating at a frequency phase that makes it invisible to your detector. And one way to tell that is to look at it from different angles. Mm -hmm. and, and see if you can see any of those effects. Uh, so I'm curious about the design of the experiment. And then oh, I have sure. a follow up question. Yeah, that's a great technical question. So I have a very good specific answer for you. I hope you like. So the size of the detector are made of Teflon because we want to avoid what you just said, which is only see direct specular light. It turns out who would have guessed this? Teflon is nearly a 100% perfect mirror for ultraviolet light at 174 nanometers. Who would have guessed that? I wouldn't have. So Teflon is a mirror for ultraviolet. So the size of the detector are Teflon in order to make sure everything bounces up into the photosensors. You're also right about the phase and stuff. We take an efficiency penalty. So we actually have a very low efficiency. It's the best we can do. But we only have a 10 percent efficiency because we have lots of effects, not just the ones you mentioned, but we have a whole host of effects that cause us to be blind. And so we take a penalty and we have to calculate this very carefully because we don't want to be, we don't want to make a fool of ourselves and claim a dark matter discovery our competitors have. And then it's because, oh, they screwed up. So we, we calculate very cautiously and carefully what the efficiency is of our photon sensors. And it's only about 10% because we lose a lot because the Teflon isn't exactly 100% reflective. So are you saying your signal to noise ratio is high? The signal to noise, well, the, the signal to noise ratio is still is still high despite the low efficiency because it's the same low efficiency for both signal and noise. Does that make sense? It doesn't matter if it's dark matter or not dark matter. It's the same flashes of light that will have the same low efficiency. Gotcha. So it does not hurt the signal to noise. Okay, my, my second question is totally bit different. Um, so uh, do you know David Baum's pilot wave theory? Have you heard of that before? Bohmian mechanics? Yes, very yeah. familiar with it. I love so, Bohm. He's a great guy. So, Was, rather, uh, I so, should say. Yeah. So it's like uh, post-quantum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yes. That there's a pilot wave, and this kind of goes to the, uh, to the um, uh, I brought up the quantum tunneling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's part of the, part of the, the, the wave gets through the, the barrier, and it, it and it is at a uh, it's slightly ahead of time. It's it's and that's why you could say it's uh, it, it's super luminal because there's actually a, a a shift to the future essentially. So I'm I'm curious about your thoughts about this uh, this this possibility of and uh, Dr. Sarfati raised this issue too. 
So. Yes, I, I, I know him. We don't, unfortunately, Dr. Safardi and I disagree on a lot of stuff, but you know what? That's okay. <laughs> I, I, I like what Tim said is I hope that even if people disagree with me, we can have a friendly conversation here today. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, I disagree with Safardi and a lot of stuff. But um, to your point about Bohmian mechanics, there's a lot of good stuff there because here's the thing. We don't know the correct interpretation. Is it Bohmian, Copenhagen interpretation, multiverse? We do not, all we know is quantum mechanics reproduces the data, but could a better alternative version of quantum mechanics reproduce the same data, but merge general relativity in there and put it all together? I think that Bo I think that there's been a lot of revisiting of ideas recently from Bohmian mechanics. Bohm is really an amazing individual because you may have heard of the Arnhoff Bohm effect. That Bohm, you know, he's the he's the Bohm in the Arnoff Bohm effect, where it was proven in the laboratory blows people's minds because it goes against classical electromagnetism. Jason's getting very excited. But basically, you can change, you can affect a particle with not with no electric field, no magnetic field, but the magnetic vector potential is not zero and you can change the phase of a particle and and bohm was one of the two it's the arnhoff bohm effect that are the two people's named after is one of the, he was one of the ones who realized who discovered this and then we have um it took decades for experimental data to prove that because it's a very hard measurement but it was not i don't think it was taken i don't know the history of it all but i think a lot of bohm's ideas were not taken very seriously during his lifetime. But I think that recently there's even a Netflix movie. That was political, about him. I think. Yeah. Totally no, it has to do with, you know, I thought he was communist, a being <laughs> communist. Exactly. He was accused of being communist. Here's the thing, though. Here's the thing, though, Michael. Just because um, your politics may be one way doesn't mean that the science that's coming out of your mouth is wrong. It can still be right. Those are separate things. And so he said a lot of great stuff that I think is being revisited now that as we struggle to, as we struggle to find a better interpretation than the boring old Copenhagen and multiverse and all this, as we struggle, I think that Bohm, Bohm's ideas are undergoing a renaissance and we're looking at them again. Okay. It's an exciting time we're living yep. in. Okay. Yep. Well, well, Michael, thank you. Sorry. Let me let me go to Remy because we're mm -hmm. right almost on the top of the hour. Oh, there's time for one more. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Remy. Oh, so uh, thanks again, Matthew. Um, You're welcome. Yeah, just about Jack here. He's he's larger in life, but he's a very sincere guy and very clever guy. Um, I just just wanted to ask you. I know you said you're not a, a theorist as such, but um, general general relativity for for most solutions, it's given negative curvature. Do you think there's a way to uncurve that, any kind of positive curvature? Because I've just got a hunch about um, about Plokotnev and what Jack is saying about his tic tac and how yeah. how he believes metamaterials and so forth. Do you think there's any way to un uncurve that negative curvature? Do you mean in a sense like that negative negative mass would do, like a reverse of gravity? Basically, is that? I just want to make well, sure I, I understand. I, I was thinking something less exotic. I mean, okay. If, if, there, if there might be a way of having positive curvature, at least locally, which might explain these things like tic tacs and mm -hmm. Bukhognev's disc and so forth. Yeah. No, I think there is a way. And actually, I ask, like I said, I'm not a theorist. So I talked to one of my colleagues who is a theorist. Um, he's actually a string theorist. I forgive him that. I don't believe in string theory, but okay. I forgive him. He's a good guy. Um, but my, my colleague Oleg, um, um, who's you know, Russian-American, yeah, I, I asked him about, uh, about the, the following, which I, I hope is getting what you, was, is going to attack what you're getting at. But basically, you know, I mentioned earlier gravitational waves and waves in space-time metric. You, because of the existence of gravitational waves, they, by definition, they're waves. They go positive and negative. They're waves. And so you can locally. And I asked my colleague Oleg this. I'm like, could you create anti-gravity by destructively interfering in gravitational waves? And he goes, oh, crap. Yeah, you can. I was like, has anyone published that? That's great. And, and like, so you could conceivably, because of the gravitational waves, if you could create artificially gravitational waves. I don't know how you're not going to put a black hole in your pocket or two black holes, you know, going around each other. But I think Remy, you could, you could at least hypothetically, I don't know how you do it practically, but you could have local cancellation of standard gravity by creating destructive interference 
of gravitational waves. The challenge would be how do you maintain that for more than a fraction mm. of a second and how you do that for long distances. But that ties in with an earlier question that someone asked about mass. I think Jason asked about, you know, mass reduction. That would be yeah. one way. Um, I, I, that doesn't violate any of our current understanding of physics at all. That is a way you yeah. could effectively appear to reduce the mass of something. Just, you could cancel gravity one. with gravitational waves, yeah. yeah. Just a quick one, for those asking how you put your hand up, it's um, Alt-Y. Get the, ah. the Alt on your keyboard, Alt-Y, yeah. put your hand up. But uh, yeah. just, just a quick one, um, about physics, um, physics dirty secret, about the, um, is it the, the energy momentum pseudo tensor? And how, on the large scale, um, energy is not conserved. What are your what What are your feelings about that? But there's no right. way of defining energy um, well in um, total energy of a system in, in re relativity, general relativity. So, I'll answer that, but I think that'll be the last thing I have to do because we're at seven oh one. Well, yeah, seven yeah. my time. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. so this is my last answer. That's a great <laughs> question, Remy. And yeah, I've actually argued this with other physicists, but actually yeah, general relativity appears to imply that energy is not conserved in the traditional sense, Be uh, only locally, unlike slices of space time. But the universe Ooh. as a whole, as it's expanding, everything's Doppler shifting and energy is essentially disappearing. And I, Now, there is a way to, again, to recover. You can always recover conservation of energy and momentum locally. But on, on the universe as a whole, whatever that means, right, because it could be infinite, I mean, there are more general conservation laws you can apply in GRs where, where yeah, technically energy is kind of conserved um, in some definition of the word conserved. But the 19th century idea of conservation of energy is definitely outdated, um, is definitely wrong because of, of, because of the, the way how we're living in a dynamical universe. Uh, universe just the existence of doppler redshift shows that you're not and the existence of dark energy if it's real and it has a constant volume by definition that's violating the traditional definition of conservation of energy but you can define more general conservation laws in gr so i wouldn't call it a dirty secret i'd rather say it's just a misconception that even physicists have among each other argue about they argue about what it means for the universe as a whole which whatever that means because the universe could be infinite it's not necessarily finite and bounded it could be but it may not be okay well wonderful I think so, that's, yeah yeah i know i think i think that's everything so here i'll meet everybody out Matthew, thank you so much. I, I'm going to put this back on gallery view. And everyone, please, a giant hand. Matthew, yeah. that, was, that was an amazing presentation. Thank you. Absolutely you. amazing. I know that you have to run. Thank I do, because my wife's going to kill me. I got to eat dinner. I do apologize to the speaker coming after me. And I said to the first <laughs> one, I'm very sorry to miss, miss the other talks. I don't do this. It's not my habit for conferences to zip in and out. But I got to eat dinner. <laughs> no, no. Oh, yeah. Thank, yeah. thank you again. You're again. welcome. Have a You're wonderful welcome. weekend. All right, you too. Take care. Okay. okay. Um, so let me let me introduce our next presenter. And, and again, I should apologize. Our, our schedule is a little bit behind, but not too bad. Brian Sinclair is an independent experimentalist and the founder of St. Clair Tech R&D, which is focused on a variety of alternative technologies, including uh, new work building upon the inertial propulsion framework developed by Branson Roy Thornton in the 70s to the 80s. So, Brian, and hey, how like are you? Here. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me okay? Absolutely. Brian, take it away, sir. And thank Terrific. you, thank you again for joining us. Matthew, that was awesome. That, that is a really tough act to follow. <laughs> okay. Um, Anyway, thanks everybody. You know, thank you, Mark, and all of you for, for in, inviting me here to this. Um, I just wanted to talk about what we're doing with inertial technology. Um, there have been a few developments. There have been a few changes in the way we've thought about it. Uh, a couple of things that we're not going to do is we're not really going to go down through the, the heavy math on this. Uh, that's something that would just bog down the presentation dramatically. I do have a couple of videos that I'm gonna be presenting. Um, and uh, if, if the background noise in the videos is too loud, I apologize. So, you know, you might wanna pay attention to that as they come up. Um, 
I wanted to also say, you know, I, I know a lot of uh, inertial, inertial propulsion, uh, much like the anti-gravity and UFO, UAP field, it's been ridiculed, uh, it's been silenced, it's well over a hundred years of just uh, sweeping it under the rug. Um, the, the established scientific community obviously says it's not possible, but there, there are a lot of things that we know are possible that somebody somewhere just doesn't want to admit because it doesn't fit into their mathematical model. Um, so it, I know that before I begin, I wanted to, I want, also want to say, you know, this is not a miracle technology. This is not meant to rise up off the ground and send us to the moon immediately. Um, I kind of see this as the model T of inertial propulsion at this point, uh, my point is that it does work. It absolutely does work. It's been proven over and over and over again uh, with, with, uh, with stiction and without stiction with, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of different types of media to move it in and through and across. Um, so anyway, I'm going to, I'm going to, Try and share my screen here. Um, let's see how this works. And we're going to go full screen on this if we can. There we go. All right. So I appreciate everybody having me here. Um, like I said, I'm going to talk today a little bit about our pulsed inertial technology, engine technology. We're, we're called knowing, knowing it is PyTech. Uh, which is very simply for pulsed inertial engine technology. Uh, the, uh, there we go. Um, that's basically the setup of a single disc, in, you know, which would be an operation. Uh, it is very similar in appearance to what we saw with uh, Roy Thornson's inertial engine that was known as the EZKL or Ezekiel, which stood for energy zone kinetic lifter. Uh, Roy's story is available in print from Tom Ballone. I saw him on here earlier. Um, uh, the Integrity Research Institute, he's got much of that available for anybody that's interested. Um, first off, um, who am I? You know, nobody's really heard of me. Well, that's fine. I've been a full-time professional automotive technician for over 35 years. Uh, I'm a trained machinist. I hold a lot of certifications in both trades, uh, automotive machining, technical machining, manufacturing machining. Um, I have several degrees in auto repair, a, a main degree in auto repair, a bachelor's degree in transportation. Uh, I'm also dual ASE certified. So I, I kind of do know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about cars and transportation and propulsion systems, at least as far as transportation on the ground. Uh, I also have management training and I've managed several garages, uh, different sizes, uh, fleet shops, trucks, cars, and everything in between. Years ago, I, I, I did a lot of dabbling in alternative fuels, alternative energy, and, and that's led up to the alternative propulsion systems. Uh, that's been going on ever since I was a teenager back in the 1980s. I, I built a, a cold vapor carburetor that, that worked really, really well. It unfortunately was at the time that carburetors were going away, fuel injection systems and computers were coming on. So that kind of fell off the edge. Um, I was also trained in industrial model making. Uh, a head of a, a multinational industrial model shop was the one that trained me on how to do this. We worked directly with uh, the engineering departments and the engineers would come down, bring us prints and we'd say, hey, we can't do this. Can you make this a little different? We'd switch it back and forth. We did a lot back and forth that way. Uh, now I'm running a small shop uh, that, that affords me a little bit of extra time to do this kind of thing. So. Let's see, uh, what is PyTech Pulsed? Inertial engine technology is simply a propulsion system. It does not push on any physical media or eject any mass for propulsion via reaction. 
So that's what we used to call reactionless propulsion. We're, we don't call it that anymore. There is no such thing as reactionless propulsion. Everything has an action and reaction, whether it's internal or external. Uh, the PyTech system can be used either in a full atmosphere, or a zero atmosphere, in full gravity, zero gravity. We, we've done some tests during free fall. We've done some tests uh, with, with wind tunneling in both directions, uh, side wind tunneling, and, and it works. It just simply works. Um, it can be used as a primary propulsion system as it gets stronger and as it gets better, of course, it, it's gonna be a little bit more efficient in that area. Uh, right now, we're looking at it more as a supplemental propulsion system. Think hybrid cars. Uh, this would be a system that could be added into any type of vehicle, uh, especially if it's transporting people, uh, whether it's on the ground or in the air. It really wouldn't matter. Um, you know, think about a, a hybrid airplane. There really is no such thing, but this could conceivably cause that to be a, a, a normal everyday operation. So what is PyTech? What it's not, it's not pseudoscience. It's not anti-gravity. It's not a warp drive. It's not a lifting system. It's not attempting to break any laws of physics. And mainly it's not difficult to replicate. Anybody can really build one if you've got a halfway decent shop and some mediocre even technical skills. Uh, I'm not here to prove anything. I'm not here to disprove anything, and I'm not here to argue the point one way or the other. I've got a lot of emails wanting to argue the point. The tremendous, tremendous amounts of emails, people wanting to argue the point. This isn't possible. I know I've spoken with Mike Gamble, and he said the same thing that you know he'll he'll gladly answer anybody's emails as long as you don't start out with, "You're breaking the laws of physics. This isn't possible." So. I fully understand where he's coming from that, with that. This presentation will not include, and these are very important points of what we're not gonna talk about, untested theory. If it's not been tested, I'm not gonna talk about it. Everything that we're going to, to discuss uh, has been tested, it's, it's been proven. So we're, we're not here to prove anything. We're not here to discuss untested theories. Uh, I'm not gonna go down through the mathematical formula. It's, it's pretty simple. The problem with the mathematical formulas that we've got right now is that it's not that they're incorrect. They're not, they're incomplete. They're put together incorrectly for what we're doing with this. So that's why mathematically this shouldn't work, but it's not the fact that mathematically it shouldn't work. It's mathematically, it's not been shown why it can work. Uh, I'm not going to do an academic tutorial on how to build one. We're not, we're not going to build one this evening. We're, this afternoon, we're, we're simply going to talk about what it is, how it works, the different stages of how, what it does. And unfortunately, I'm not good at computer graphics, so we're not going to have fancy graphics in this. Um, I'm here simply to present a mechanical system with working prototypes, uh, the, and we're going to present the working prototypes that are currently being tested. Uh, what is PyTech capable of propelling? Virtually anything that moves. Like I said, can you imagine having an electric hybrid, otherwise fossil fueled airplane, uh, whether it, it would be a prop plane or a jet plane or a space plane? It, it's absolutely incredible. And the fact that we can supplement the propulsion system on virtually anything at this point. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's in the, on the earth, in the air, in space, in the water, under the water, it really doesn't matter. It simply works. Uh, how is this different? There, there've been a lot of different ones out there and, and I don't wanna bash on anybody's systems because everybody's put out a, on a tremendous amount of work on these things and I really, I, I really wanna show a lot of respect to those people. Uh, Branson Roy Thornson was the one that came up with the entire uh, stationary sun gear system that we're using right now. Um, so, but this, this does different from his system, from some of the others in ways that we just didn't expect were going to happen. Uh, we, we have combined multiple technical methods into a single system and it doesn't not reply or re rely solely upon one component in that technology. 
Uh, it can be easily used in conjunction with virtually any other vehicle propulsion system. It does not matter what the propulsion system currently is. It will work with it. And it can be fully self-contained. The battery, the charger, the power plant, everything in a sealed container with a, with a simple on-off switch, or it can be directly connected to a vehicle so that it would have onboard control systems. Uh, I wanted to do a quick timeline of the vehicle, the, the PyTech project's development up to this point. It's a very quick video. I apologize if the, if the background audio is a little much. I tried to drop that down and maybe add a little bit of, 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 a, of a musical background, but uh, that was probably not the best idea either. So without any further ado, that was the very first set of gears that we tried. That was the very first Thornton prototype that we put together that actually did work. It would actually self-propel. That one had enough power to not only propel itself, but it would actually push objects up and down the workbench. On to the next model. This is where we started calling it a pie, not just a Thornson Ezekiel drive. Um, one of our projects has been actually worked on overseas. Uh, Tokyo Muramatsu, he's, he's really helped a lot. And I thought this was an incredible little piece of video. This was the first time I ever saw anybody ride on any kind of an inertial propulsion system. It was just absolutely amazing to me. And this is where he, he is actually developing it a little bit further and a little bit further. That is his ongoing project at this point. This was the first time that any of them had been really videoed mounted in a motor vehicle. We were getting ready to do our first road test. That same unit before it was mounted in the vehicle. And on to the system that we're putting together now, which is the four series I systems. Uh, we, we've made some considerable improvements since the originals. This was the first time that we actually had the new propulsion system actually moving uh, with its new outer stops. A lot of what we're using right now, what we're using right now in the latest one is, is all in this model. And coming soon, we're going to have the Pi X, uh, X not standing for the 10, but standing more for an internal design of the unit. It's, it's kind of unknown at this point. So X kind of works for both of those. All right. Uh, the combined technologies that we are using, gyroscopic precession, uh, gyroscopic time-based shifting, centripetal inertia, mass acceleration and deceleration, impact thrust, and it's all controlled both with mechanical and electronic controls. Those are the things that really make this a lot different than some of the other systems that have been out there. Uh, we'll cover what those items are and how they're in play in the system, the gyroscope and the gyroscopic precession. They're only slightly in play for the actual, actual propulsion of the system. Uh, 
there are effectively multiple gyroscopes running in each unit. And it really works more for stabilization of the rotating assemblies than it does for the propulsion itself, although it does play into the propulsion itself. Uh, a 4D gyroscope, uh, gyroscopes with a time base or velocity shift, those have been what are shown to have uh, some serious different effects, not just the standard gyroscopic effect with, with uh, being able to stabilize and, and things like that. Uh, the alternative gyroscopic phenomena tend to present themselves when the time shifts and the velocity changes are introduced. And without them, even, uh, even with the other technologies, they, they, the time shift is part of the system that makes it work as well as it does. Uh, the centripetal force, of course, you know, we utilize the centripetal force. That's much like the Ezekiel was, uh, Roy's system, uh, changing the arc radius of the weight orbiting the center axle. Uh, it, it comes in closer, it co goes out further away. And, and that's simple, plain, everyday centripetal force. That alone is not going to be enough power to make a system that could move a motor vehicle. Uh, the mass velocity changes, those also were happening in Roy's system, and we're, we've really expanded on that quite a ways. Uh, the reciprocating mass accelerates and decelerates during each cycle, not only when it comes to the center and touches off in the center, but also when it gets to, to the outside. It, slow, it also slows down as it approaches center and speeds up as it leaves center. So we've got some serious velocity change going on there. Uh, the acceleration and deceleration of the mass is because of the position in the cycle, the, the mass caused uh, acceleration, deceleration of the mass caused by the rotational speed change, which is the speed differential control. That's the electronic control that we've added to it that boosts the speed just about the same time that you would normally see it slowing down because of motor load. And then we have the sudden deceleration of the mass due to contact with the stops. Uh, years ago, Roy called those uh, those stops uh, a, a whole different set of things. The, the, he never even used the word stops in in his system. We we use stops. They're not they're not brakes. They're not uh, traps or or anything else that he used in some of his dialogue. Uh, the impact thrust that's got an awful lot to do with it. And I know Tom Ballone spoke about. Uh, the impact thrust having a lot to do with uh, Roy Thornson's system. Uh, that is the thrust that's caused by the moving mass impacting another portion of the assembly. And the mass impacts with the center axle, pushing everything forward. It impacts again with the planet gear mounted stop or the outer stop, uh, which we've, we've improved dramatically as well. The impacts equal sudden mass deceleration and we have changed those weights to not simply be a weight as such. It's not just a hunk of metal or a hunk of something going around. It is actually a dead blow weight, much like a dead blow hammer would be. Uh, it's hollow, it's filled with shot, and that effectively lengthens the amount of time that each impact has effect on its stop. Uh, the mechani mechanical and the electronic controls, they're, they're pretty straightforward. The mechanical control uses the planetary gears to continuously modify the movement and in the, in the inertia and the mass velocity. Uh, the mechanical stops, therefore impact and mass deceleration. The electronic control of the drive motor base speed. We have, we have a very simple speed control system with the speed differential controller on it, which is the electronic control of rotational acceleration and deceleration. So the whole unit speeds up and slows down, depending on the design of the unit, two to four times per revolution. Step-by-step uh, -step, step function of it, this was a, this was a picture that was generated uh, by my, my uh, friend, uh, Tokyo. Uh, and, and this shows basically starting out, okay, we've got, we've got one weight out front. This, this is the progression as 
the the unit is trying to move forward. It's it's moving from right to left. Uh, it's a little bit hard to follow because it's not in motion in the picture. So I wanted to show this quick little orbital cycle. Um, this is this was also generated by Tokyo. This shows the actual cycle of a single gear and weight assembly. Impact center comes around, impacts the outer stop. And again, this is in motion from right to left. Um, and, and depending on the speed of the rotation would depend on the timing of when it would impact the center and impact the, the outer stop. The outer stop is fully adjustable. So we can actually change that correlation between the time when it hits the inner and time that it hits the outer. Um, we'll go through real quick. When, in position one in the center, when the weight is in the center, um, it's contacting the center axle and it comes very near to a stop. Uh, this is right here is where it would impact the center on the left, uh, the center position with the weight not in rotation anymore. Momentarily, it hits that and it simply stops in its rotation. This particular series, it's moving from left to right. And you can see that it would be hitting the center and pushing the assembly to the right. And then as it leaves that center position, this is where the power stroke really begins what I call the power stroke, that's, that's where the, uh, the power of the electric motor that runs this is really under its heaviest load. That's also the place where our speed differential control starts speeding everything up. Uh, position two, that power stroke, as I was just saying, the, the movement is sideways to the direction of travel, therefore it has little or no effect. Now that means that when it's swinging out here, it's trying to push sideways. It's not moving forward or back. That's why two wheels in counter rotation work so well with this because it, it counters that. It has little or no effect on the actual uh, propulsion of it. It does add to vibration of it if it doesn't, if we don't use a, a counter rotating unit. Uh, that is exactly where the speed differential control would accelerate the RPMs. As it comes up and hits the outer stop, this is the older design outer stop. We had a, a simple metal block welded to the gear and, a, and another metal tab welded to the backside of the swinging weight assembly. It would come up against this and it would literally just simply jerk the whole gear in the direction that you want the unit to move. Um, this, this generally just converts that, that uh, unit into that unidirectional thrust. Uh, this is also where the gears are under their most reverse thrust and where we've broken a lot of gears. That's why we're using gears that we can throw together, we can tear them apart, and if we blow them up, we throw them away and we don't worry about the cost. Uh, it, when, when we started out looking at machine shop gears, the, the cost was going to be very prohibitive as soon as we started realizing we're going to start blowing gears and tearing teeth off of gears on these things. Uh, position four, when the, when the thrust begins, it continues until the weight reaches a point at or near just past its apex, the apex being considered when the weight is furthest away from the center axle. Uh, at this point, that's where the speed differential control has released it's returned the RPM of the whole rotating assembly back to its normal RPM setting. And at position five, we're coming back around. We're, we're basically done propelling. Uh, it's, it's, you could really look at this as reset. It's resetting to do the job over again. So during this period of time, if we had another set of gears and wheels in operation. This was when they would help take up some of that pulse so that it wouldn't pulse as badly and, and, and performance of course would be uh, greatly improved. The, the dead blow weight, I'm telling you, that really made a significant improvement. That was a game changer with this whole thing uh, because when it hits the, that, that dead blow weight just really, really 
helps out the propulsion. And at that point, the rotating cycle begins all over again. Uh, adjustments, adjustments are really critical on this. And I, when I say they're really critical, gross overall adjustment is very critical. Minor adjustment is, but it's not. Uh, we can just, we, we can tweak it and peak it and get a little bit more power out of it with the minor adjustments. But the first important point of adjustment, <coughs> excuse me, the outer mechanical stops. Um, at the point when we're, we're generally using two weights on a, on a single wheel on our units at this point. And at the same point when the rear one is contacting the center, that's just about the time when the front one is about to or has just started to contact the outer stop. That actually doubles up on both of those impacts. So we're getting two impacts for the price of one. It, it really has been, like I say, another game changer. Uh, the second important point of adjustment is where the, the exactly where in the rotation um, everything comes to that, that impact. And generally, it's going to be with the forward weight in the 20 to 45 degrees before it gets to apex. Um, that, that has worked out really the best for us. Uh, I know Roy talked about that in some of the things that he wrote. Uh, he was of the impression that 30 degrees was just about right. I've found that it really does depend on how heavy the weights are, what type of weights you're using, and how fast you're rotating the entire unit. Uh, it is speed dependent. Um, it does work at very, very low RPMs. It also works well at reasonably higher RPMs. What it does not do is it does not work well at very high RPMs. So this adjustment is made by adjusting the position of the sun gear. Basically, we unlock the sun gear and rotate it. And that, that simply repositions where the, where the weights are going to be hitting uh, their stops. And like I said, this, this is an adjustment that's not so much made by how many degrees before dead center, before apex. This is an adjustment that is made by performance and performance at this point, we're measuring a lot of our performance using a force meter, an electronic force meter so that we can see forward propulsion, rearward propulsion, and we can even hook it up sideways and see how much sideways propulsion we're trying to, to get rid of, um, you know, that, that vibration. So one thing that is important to note that once this is really and truly incorporated into a vehicle design, it could be reversed simply by putting an actuator on that center gear. We could turn that center gear around completely backward and you would actually have uh, an inertial system that would not just propel it forward, but it would actually pull it backward as well. Nice for a braking system, nice for, for a positioning system, terrific for sideways movement because it can be it can be repositioned in any direction that you would want 360 degrees around the third point of adjustment um the speed differential control that's what we were talking about speeds it up as it gets into its power uh stroke so to speak uh that's adjusted to increase the rotation speed when the rear mass is just about ready to leave the center axle stop uh, this is easily identified using a, an ammeter, especially a, if it's hooked to a lab scope. Uh, we can identify the exact position where that speed differential control should trip in by the exact moment that the motor amperage starts to rise. Uh, the in speed increase, uh, it cuts off just before the mass reaches its apex position. That is nowhere near as important as when it begins. Uh, it's nice to have it uh, maintain the higher RPM until it gets just about to the apex. But if it stopped a little sooner or a little bit later, it really wouldn't make as big of a difference as it does when it starts increasing the speed. Uh, the fourth point 
of adjustment, the RPM adjustment itself, the speed differential control should be a 75 to 100% increase above the base RPM. So if we're running the base RPM at 100 RPMs, it should raise that RPM level to 175 to 200 RPMs just for that moment of increase. Uh, the optimal RPM settings are yet to really truly be determined and they're, they're currently being adjusted by monitoring for per, uh, performance. And a lot of that, the, the bigger and heavier it is, the slower it likes to run, the smaller and lighter it is, the faster it likes to run, but only up to a point and then it becomes self-destructive. Uh, the fifth important point of adjustment are the phase adjustments. And that, that's something that a lot of people have not really looked at very much. The two masses on a single wheel uh, can reach the apex at the same point in rotation. The variance between those two points should be less than 20 degrees. That means that within that 20 degrees, you could have the center, uh, the weight hitting the center pin, maybe 20 degrees sooner, maybe 20 degrees later than the outer one does. That will actually increase the amount of time of propulsion. So it, it can be a good thing. It can also be a detriment because if, if, it's, if it's increased too much, then the pulse is not high enough to, to really be strong enough. Uh, so it's something that has to be weighed out between the two and, and that's all been done at this point uh, just by monitoring the performance. Um, the goal of the pie is so far determine the phasing of the wheels. Uh, the wheel phasing as a propulsion assistance device can be 90 degrees out of phase between the two wheels. So if you've got a right wheel and a left wheel or a top wheel and a bottom wheel, they can be 90 degrees out of phase with one another. It does create a little extra side to side vibration to do that, but it also helps as a, a, a hybrid type, a helper pusher design. If it's made for self-propulsion without anything else helping it move, then pulsed all at the same time, uh, synchronized very closely is really the better way to go as it simply works much, much better. Um, the, the important noted observations, seven of the, of the most important ones that I wanted to speak about real quick here. Um, phasing can be changed, obviously, depending on usage. As we just spoke about the phase, whether it, whether they're phased together or they're phased 90 degrees apart, uh, 45 degrees apart, it, the more wheels and the that you, you would use and the phasing could be changed for smoother operations. Uh, multiple components, they all have to work together. If they're not adjusted properly to work together, it's just going to tear itself apart and we're not gonna get any, any propulsion out of it. Uh, longer impact times from the dead blow weights have been a real game changer. That's something that as far as I know, nobody else has tried in any of their systems. It works exceptionally well. Um, the speed or RPM changes are primary importance. Uh, we've seen that in Tolkov Tolkien ship off devices and are there similar units that have shown some uh, degree of operation? And it's, it's shown to be a, a, a real big part of the, the efficiency of this design as well. Um, the stops, all the stops have to transmit impact very firmly. They can have padding on them to reduce noise but too much padding and the impact is also diminished and therefore so is our propulsion. Something that I'm gonna come back to this in a couple of minutes, inertial Doppler. This is something that, that is something that I've never heard anybody speak about before. I've not seen anything written about it before. Uh, I know a little while ago, I, I, my, my ears perked up when Michael Boyd said quantitized inertia. And, and that may be a lot of exactly what we're talking about, that it is a measurable phenomenon. We're calling it inertial Doppler. It may not be a, uh, an accurate description, but for now, that's, that's what we're using. 
And the, the last, and I think that one of the very most important things that we need to do is we have to have collaboration with other experimenters. Uh, we, need, we need independent uh, experimenters to be building units and verifying operational points. And we can all work together to make these things work just so much better. Uh, so the, the terminology for, of inertial Doppler, it might not be technically accurate. Uh, the fact remains that the faster a vehicle is traveling with a pi unit in it, the stronger the pi becomes. So is that because of some, this is a, a good question for the group, for, the, for anybody out there that, that may have some idea about this. Uh, is that caused by an inertial Doppler effect? Uh, are we actually making a Doppler effect of, of pushing energy out in front of this? Or are we simply pushing harder against its own mass and causing a stronger pulsation? It, either way, I'm not 100% sure which is true. Uh, we've got a lot of testing to do before we would absolutely know uh, one way or the other on that. If I was to indulge in a little conjecture, any energy manipulation is, if any energy manipulation is involved uh, with using and recycling inertia, those energy fields could exhibit a Doppler-like effect. And, and that's just like what Michael was speaking of with quantitized inertia earlier. Um, more study and testing is gonna be necessary. We're gonna need to understand this a little better. Uh, I, I think we need to understand this a lot better. Uh, the effect is experienced in a moving vehicle. It's measurable, it's undeniable, it's there, it's real, it's true. Uh, the design changes from the early days to where we are at now. Um, we, we had counter rotating and same rotating units. Uh, we've had them that were driven by a timing belt that were side to side. We've used the double decker design with a roller chain drive. The roller chain drive was another good change that we added because there can't be any slippage uh, and, and timing is always held much, much better with a, with a chain. Uh, the belts with their, with their soft teeth sometimes tend to slip a little or they'll uh, just even, even have a little bit of a, a deflection and that's caused some problems. We've added ramps on the ends of the weights. They've actually, they, they serve two purposes. They, they, they hold the weights uh, in center a little longer. They also keep those weights from jamming against the ends of the, the end of the weight jamming against the center pin. If you go back and look at some of the videos of Roy Thornson with his demonstrator units, he had that same problem. This has completely eliminated that problem. We have zero jamming anymore. Uh, the gear motor with the speed controller, that was a huge, huge improvement. Uh, it, it's strong, it's smooth, it draws very little power, and, and it's just, it's, it's very, very reliable. The dead blow weight design, as we spoke about before, uh, that, that increases the amount of time that each impact happens, and that was a real game changer for the overall design. The, the speed differential control, adding that fourth dimension to the gyroscope, fourth dimension being time, uh, height, width, depth, and then time uh, has been a real big deal. And then of course, the, the very last major change that we made was the improved adjustable outer stop system. And that, that has really been a big improvement on how energy is transmitted during that, that outer stop sequence. Uh, just a few pictures of the different ones. We've, we've got the counter rotating, um, and then we've got same rotation. We've got the double decker, and that leads us up to where we're at right now with the Pi 4.8. And in the picture, I, I, hopefully you can see my cursor. Uh, we've got the gear motor. We've got the new improved outer stop design. This way, when the, when the weight comes around and hits that, the end of that bolt, that's that's adjustable so that we can change the timing between when it's contacting the center and when it contacts that outer stop. Those are all big, big uh, improvements in the way it works. And right here, you can see 
the actuator for the speed differential control. There's actually a micro switch. We're not using sensors. This is plain, simple electrical, uh, no, no electronics other than the uh, speed controller. Um, plain, plain uh, micro switch on a, on a ramp type actuator. Things that didn't work, I, I like to talk about the things that don't work because if I only talked about the things that do work, number one, uh, I'd be an idiot. Uh, that, that's all there is to it. You know, we all have things that we try that don't work. And if we ignore those, we don't learn and we don't move forward. So the things that didn't work well or didn't work at all, uh, the very high speeds, they, they're very destructive. The, uh, at this point, I've not had one that runs at a high speed that will actually hold itself together long enough to self-propel. Uh, three weights per wheel. It sounded like a great idea at the time. Let's make a triangular pattern and have three weights, three gears rotating on each wheel. Did not work out well. Uh, torsion springs on the weights to allow them to hit a little harder, to hold things in place a little longer. Again, not, not a great design. Uh, the soft tooth quiet gears, we tried that, trying to reduce the amount of noise that these make. Um, the soft tooth gears, unfortunately, the, they've got too, too much deflection in the teeth of the gears, and we would actually slip timing. Uh, we had some internal crashes and a lot of broken pieces. Uh, magnetic weight swing controls. Uh, this is something that Roy Thornson was experimenting with. He was using electromagnets. Um, he used them, he called them planet traps because of the planetary gear system, and he thought he was trapping energy and then releasing it when he needed to. Uh, they just did not work out well. I think the mechanical systems that we're using right now, especially with the ramps on the ends of the of the weights, is working out much much better. Uh, we did try a latching lever weight swing control where the the weights would latch into position, be held in place until they came around to a certain position. Then the latches would release, worked great for a few minutes, and then the latches would start to malfunction and, and just bad things would happen, a lot of broken pieces again. Uh, and we've had a lot of really small component changes that, you know, that most of them were running changes that we, we don't even consider, uh, you know, looking back at the notes, it's like, oh gosh, I, I forgot that we even tried that. They, they were almost inconsequential. Um, the general specifications right now, we're using a 14 inch diameter wheel. The masses are two kilograms each. Uh, we're using a, a Chinese built 350 watt DC motor. It's, a, it's designed to run 24 volts. It will run 12 volts just as well. Uh, it's basically an electric bicycle motor. So it's designed for long-term operation and some pretty hard use. Uh, we're using a pulse width modulated motor speed controller. It's a cheap unit. It, it, they're simply inexpensive, off the shelf components. Um, we're using number 40 roller chain and sprockets for the drive. And right now we are using about 60 watts of power consumption. Now we have not, I have not personally put my lab scope on and verified that uh, root mean square would actually show that 60 watts is our maximum, but averaged out with a meter, 60 watts is where we're running. So that, that's really not all that bad. Uh, as a quick recap, uh, thrust is generated through a combination of impact, mass displacement, centripetal force, and the 4D gyroscopic flywheel. Uh, where we're going from here, the testing and research and development is continuing. We're continuing to improve the designs. Um, we are making all of the technical details 100% open source public information. It's available on my website. Uh, the, there'll be a, a link to the website shown in a few minutes, and I can always put one up in the chat. Um, and with enough design, improvement, I think that we really are going to have a unit that will actually leave the ground. And that will be a truly exciting moment when we actually can video a unit pulling itself up off the ground. Uh, a few last minute additional things that weren't originally in this. Um, I wanted to mention that there's a swing test video online now. 
<clears throat> a lot of people have asked, <clears throat> excuse me, have asked me to put the unit on some sort of hangers so that they can see it move without any kind of a friction against the ground. I don't agree that this is a perfectly good way to do it. Uh, it passes the test. The video is online. It, because it's a pulse system and because of the length of the, of the hangers, we had to slow it down. And so, yes, there is some swing back, but we'll hold in the positive direction two to three times longer than, than it will swing back for. Um, it, it's, it, it simply works. I mean, that, that's all there is to it. Uh, road test data, we're road testing right now, the latest design. It's, it's in the vehicle right now at this very moment. Um, I've got to do some more adjustments to it before our next run. We, we generally put about 20 miles per test sequence on the units, uh, 10 miles without it running, 10 miles with it running, so that we're running up and down the same test track over and over and over again under the exact same conditions. Uh, engine load is what we're monitoring because that is the easiest and simplest uh, indication of whether or not we've got good performance coming from the, the Pi system. Um, we, I think we need to change that configuration to four rotating wheels. I think that that's going to smooth the design and of course it's going to increase the power by at least two. Um, I would like to change the speed differential control to an electronic sensor. I'm, I'm looking at optical sensors at this point, they'd be quick, they'd be easy, they'd be very easy to set up uh, and, and they're quite reliable. Uh, we need to smooth the pulsing. <laughs> that, that again, that, that's, that's pretty much goes without saying. Uh, but if we change the configuration to four wheels and use the optical sensors, I think that's gonna go a long way towards smoothing the pulse operation. The upcoming Pi X, uh, I mentioned this when, when we talked uh, a while back, uh, Mark had us on, had me on. We talked about it a little bit. Um, Pi X is a is a system that's an up up and coming system. I don't have full information on that that I can release just yet. Uh, it will be released eventually, but right now it's not entirely my design. And until I have permission. I'm simply not going to step on anyone's toes and, and cause anybody any undue uh, pain, suffering or anything else. Um, that one, however, I can tell you that uses a not new set of power storage designs. Uh, there will be a complete set of power storage units built into it. And that should also help make the system much, much smoother. Uh, I want I do have a, a quick compilation of just all the different units that I've ever had in the shop that we've built that we that would actually self propel. Again, there, there's background noise, but I didn't add music to this one, so don't don't shoot me on that one. Um, the the noise is going to be from the units themselves running, so this gives you a really good idea of why we're talking about wanting to put this either in a box with something to dampen the noise or quieter components. We, we've talked about that on the videos. If you go to the YouTube channel, that's what we've talked about there. So here we go, self-propulsion clips.
I, I I do. I call that a success. I know I know I had some people that uh, insisted that that didn't show anything, but the the carriage underneath it actually rolls easier than it does. It's not pushing on it. It's not pulling on it. Uh, it it shows definite self propulsion. Um, I want to thank everybody for for watching for staying with me this long. I, I I tend to be a little on the boring side, and I didn't have a terrific presentation, but I threw this together because I wanted to let everybody see what we've got going on. Um, my website www.stclairtech.tech. Uh, there's links there to all of the blog information. That that's all the builder information starting from basically right at the beginning of the project all the way through to where we're at right now. It's got also got links to the videos. Um, it's got a link to my email, uh, St. Clair Tech at stclairtech.tech. Uh, the videos can be seen at YouTube uh, at St. Clair Tech RD. Um, Tokyo Muramatsu, he, he's done some amazing things uh, over the years, and then he's been working on a on a Pi system. He's been working on the on the Pi three series, and he's done some absolutely amazing things with just one or two weights on there. Uh, I, I I encourage anybody to go and take a look at it. His YouTube channel DFTDMT. Uh, just type that into the into the uh, search, and it'll take you right to his YouTube channel. And of course, uh, Tom over at Integrity Research, I can't thank him enough for, for some of the help that he's given me and some of the information. Um, he's got a huge assortment of information, books, videos, and such over at integrityresearchinstitute.org. So that's pretty much all I've got at this point. And uh, I, I really appreciate everybody staying with me and listening and, uh, Let's see if I can figure out how to unshare my screen. We'll we'll be in pretty good shape. Oh, uh, you know, Brian. It, actually, I can do that for you. So let, let me do that. Terrific. I'm going to do stop sharing. Yeah. And actually, before we do anything else, I'm going to put this on gallery mode. Everyone, please give Brian St. Clair an enormous applause, sir. Thank you for presenting that. I thought that was a great presentation, and I mean, you covered a ton of different stuff. Um, so let's go into the Q&A session. Uh, Bernie has a question. So I will ask Bernie to unmute. Up, in, up in Vancouver, right, Bernie? Uh, Calgary, pretty close, Alberta. Are you, do you guys have a heat wave up there? Oh, yes, we definitely do. Yeah, because I'm in the Seattle area and it's sweltering here. Oh, yeah, it, it's, it's hot and dry, which is nice for Canada, but scary. It's the beginning of the summer. Uh, my question for Brian is, has he heard, ever seen uh, the YouTube channel VE Pro Project One? And it's a uh, Chinese channel that uh, he does a lot of similar, um, they call them like overbalanced wheels or gravity wheels, but what it really, that's, or perpetual motion, but that's not what it is. That's 